All right, what's up? Oh, um, well, this is sort of a broad sort of question, I think, about status of morality. Mm-hmm. And I think it underpins a lot of your discussions. I mean, the last time we talked, which was a few months ago, yeah, we sort of got into it a bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I don't know. I have quite a few arguments in defense of objective morality because okay. you seemed pretty passionate about uh, against the notion of there being like one true objective morality Mm -hmm. um and maybe you could elaborate a bit on what you mean by that um okay so you seem to know all of these words so you can tell me if i butcher the fuck out of any of this so i think and you can tell me if i'm wrong i'm probably Mm -hmm. a very strict materialist and that i believe that the entire world is related to the existence of physical things and that that is the right. entirety of the, the universe. Or at least, I would say, whatever we're capable of interacting with and perceiving. So maybe there does exist some extra supernatural stuff, but it doesn't impact us, we don't interfere with it, and it doesn't interfere with us, right? So I would be a materialist? Right, it, it sounds like, um, like in the history of philosophy, uh, in like the early... 20th century at the movement known as the logical positivists that mm-hmm. try to rule out uh, any notion that didn't uh, interact or refer to anything directly in the physical world. Okay. So statements about ethics, for example, are meaningless because within the statement, uh, it is good to help others. Uh-huh. Oh, where's the referent there to the real world gotcha so right? so i would agree that it's meaningless if you're um and i use the expression frame of reference here um maybe observer would be better i don't know but if your frame of reference is the universe or if the universe is an observer then i would argue that that is a meaningless statement right that that any philosophical ought is a meaningless statement so for instance we ought to help children we ought to be good to our fellow man or whatever that those are meaningless statements but in relation to ourselves as humans i i wouldn't say that those are all meaningless statements so i'm not advocating for like um total um applied moral relativism or like total nihilism or anything like that i guess okay right but the actual truth value of a moral statement isn't it, it would differ depending on the individual, would you say? Kind of, yeah. Or rather that, like, um, we should not murder. That statement is true in a different sense than um, two particles will always exert some gravitational um, attraction on to each other. That these two statements are different types of truths. Like, the difference between, like, a normative and a descriptive claim, and, and that these are entirely different things. Like, the, any any moral claim you make has no basis in, in the in the physical materialistic world. It's just like a human construct is what I would say. Right. Okay. Well, well I, I don't know if I've ever really heard of like a, a pluralist because when you say that there's more than one notion of truth, that to me it doesn't make a ton of sense. Um, okay, hold on. Because hold on, I know that what I'm saying is not, I'm not the only person to say this, so maybe I just need to find different words. So, for instance, um, if I were to say um, um, Theodore is black, there are two different types of statements I could be making. I could argue that Theodore is black in the sense that his actual physical color is black versus Theodore is black and that black is some socially constructed notion of race that we as humans have. That one of those statements is like a factual descriptive claim of a, of a physical property, something on the on the electromagnetic spectrum that can be measured, et cetera. And that the other thing is a um, is is more of a claim that isn't like that. Is there what is there like a better word to describe this? Do you, or do you understand what I'm saying? Or? Well, I, I don't think the there's any difference in truth there because it the only thing that makes something true is if you know it meets the condition of what we call true. So saying that Theodore is black in the sense of you know his skin exhibits like a certain uh, reflects certain amount of light or whatever mm-hmm. that that is true in virtue if it's if as we understand the world it meets the conditions of what we're considering black in that sense. But okay. If we're talking about black in the sense of uh, you know a race mm-hmm. and you know meets. Whatever you want to really define black, it's as long as we are meeting what we are considering the definition of black, I don't think the notion 
okay, uh, so truth changes. I guess like what I'm getting at is um, that when you say what we are considering, so if black is defined as a certain um, wavelength, uh, I don't know if I should say this with the color black, if black refers to a specific wavelength on the EM spectrum, but I don't think it does. I think black is the absence of color. Um, so I'll say um, I'll say yellow. Okay, if yellow refers to a wavelength on the electromagnetic spectrum, this is something that we can define, and it is not relative to an, an individual's like personal beliefs, but rather it is um, it, it's like something that we can give like a rigid definition for. Whereas if two people say um, this um, this rice dish tastes good. These can be, tr uh, or, or if one person says it's good and the other person says it's bad, for both people, these can be true statements, but they're making contrary claims about it. What, so what am I describing here, I guess? Well, like even, can we not make uh, descriptive claims about, you know, societal, uh, cultural beliefs? Like saying that, you know, someone is Asian, for example, I, I don't think you need to reduce that down, down to any sort of physical level. It's a... Uh, a statement about you know what we are considering Asian as well, sure, a society. I, I'm just trying to, but I'm saying that, like different people could consider it differently. Is what I'm saying. What would you call these statements where people can have disagreements on what you're calling matters of fact? I, I don't. I don't really know if they're. It, it comes down to. A, a, uh, I don't know. I'm not really familiar with any sort of. Uh, system that would differentiate between the two because well, like so, let's differ so, depending on the context. So let's and let's use the let's just stick with the food example then. Two people eat a rice dish. One guy says yep. this dish tastes bad, and the other one says this dish tastes good. Um, these are things that each person has personal subjective feelings about. How do you? How can they both make? And nobody would argue. I don't think that either statement is false. So how can two people make contradictory claims about the same thing and both statements be true? How is this okay. possible? So it it comes down to your view about meaning and mm -hmm. what counts as meaningful and what counts as meaningless. I'd assume from your point of view, you'd consider uh, either claim. For example, I think you or someone who holds a similar position would probably translate the statement, um, this food tastes good, to something like, I have a emotional feeling that makes me feel pleasure when I eat this food. You would want to translate it to something like that because that's actually referential to something in the real world as opposed to some normative claim about what goodness is. Uh, so you would deny that any claim about aesthetics is probably what this would fall under, have any sort of truth value. And so the claim, this food is good, really doesn't have any objective uh, truth value. It's as a guy named A.J. Iyer, who I absolutely detest, mm -hmm. uh, argued that claims about aesthetics and moral judgments are really just emotional reactions. Yeah, that was going to be what I, that's what I was going to ask you next. Then couldn't I make that same argument then about moral claims that these are things that make me feel good rather than these are actual objective claims? Well, the emotivism was born out of uh, logical positivism and the view that anything that doesn't refer to something in the, the real world is meaningless. Um, and, you know, within the philosophical community now, logical positivism is dead because it doesn't work. It's very much self-refuting. And so really lying at the Wait, heart... Wait, can you, for the, um, for the listeners that might not know what that is, can you define logical positivism? Well, it's a very hard thing to clearly defined, but I can give my best go at it because it's basically, it's an umbrella term for a whole bunch of different views that were born, uh, you know, out of, uh, out of Bertrand Russell and G.E. Moore's empiricism. And it's, it was against the, if anyone knows about, you know, idealism and German idealism, it was revolting against the notion of, you know, some omnipotent, and a lot of subjectivism, whatever. And it was all reducing it down to empirical concepts. So basically, the most common form of logical positiv positiv positivism today, I think, uh, and one that actually I think most scientists hold, I would say most scientists are probably logical positivists, is falsificationism, which is Popper's view. Is that and the idea that if something can't be falsified, it's not worth consideration? Or exactly, if some if uh, if hypothesis or any statement is not falsifiable, then it is not a meaningful statement. Okay, uh, Oof, this so, sounds like stuff that I might believe in. Does that make me a bad person? Well, I mean, do you want me to give you a case as to why it just doesn't work right yeah. off the bat? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I love talking about this stuff. So, okay. 
So a few issues with uh, uh, falsificationism is the fact that it rules out uh, purely existential hypotheses. Uh, like, for example, if I say, uh, let me think of a good example, because I don't want to give a, a misleading example that's confusing. Yeah. Uh, let me think here. Um, something like... Uh, there exists at least one unicorn, for example. That becomes a meaningless statement. Okay. Even though, is it? It, it doesn't because you can never falsify a statement like that, right? Sure. There exists at least one unicorn. But is there um, a reason why I shouldn't think that's a meaningless statement, or? Well, because if you extend that to things like, uh, let me think. Uh, Again, I have to think of a good example that that isn't utterly misleading. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> if I if I don't actually here, I can think of a better way to put this. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think about how I can. Do you have like a piece of paper or something maybe <laughs> that um, you can? Sure. Or, or I can do it. So let's say we have two sentences. Okay. Okay. Let's call one sentence S. Okay. And we call one sentence N. Okay. Uh, let S be the sentence, this apple is red. Okay. Okay. This is by the falsificationist criterion about what it takes for something to be meaningful. This is clearly a meaningful statement. Yes. Because if I look at the apple and it's blue, well, it's falsified. I can hypothetically falsify that statement, so it's meaningful. Okay. And let's take the statement, um, the absolute is beautiful as my other statement okay uh that's not falsifiable how would you even begin trying to falsify something like that so clearly that's a, a meaningless statement okay and now let's combine those two sentences together uh and create a conjunction uh of the two uh s and n okay so both the apple is red and the absolute is beautiful I think maybe someone in your position would try to object to something like that, that that really isn't a meaningful sentence because it contains a constituent, that being that the absolute is beautiful, and it starts to imply that that itself is falsifiable. Well, I mean, I would, I would just look at it as two, two statements, and if one is false, then the entire statement is falsifiable, right? But, but in natural language, uh -huh. we usually don't do that. Because well, but we're not talking now. We're talking philosophy right now, right? If somebody says like the officer is taller and stronger than you, if the officer was taller and weaker than me, then I would argue, well, that statement is false without any kind of. Yeah, but both of those things are um, meaningful statements that you just made. Yeah, but it's also, but well, but those are also falsifiable statements as well. Right. That's why they're meaningful. It's because they are false. Sure, but it, I guess like if I were to tackle these two statements, you would tackle the claims individually. Just conjoining the statements doesn't mean that you all of a sudden are. are um, so, like, let's say for instance, um, the uh, the um, the man is taller and more handsome than you, right? That in that statement, I, you would grapple with two separate claims. Well, is he taller? Yes or no? And then is he more handsome? Well, you can't meaningfully answer that. So you would just answer the first claim, and you would say that the second one is is meaningless or undefinable or subjective or whatever. Right, I, I suppose, so, but I feel like in natural language we don't really do that. Well, what is na um, I don't understand how the natural language is used well, for anything here. I mean, this really goes even further, like further down, because this connects to so many different branches, and I, and I don't want to get overly off topic. But this will actually tie into something I'll say later on. So there's this guy; he's my favorite philosopher. Okay, uh, his name is Thomas Kuhn. Uh, Whoa! No racial slurs on my channel, please. Oh, okay, right. I'm just fucking. Sorry, God. U H N. Okay, just yeah, go ahead. I'm just clarification. Um, and he's a very famous. Uh, he leveled a very famous attack against uh, Karl Popper. Uh, in that. Okay, so let let's say that we are a falsificationist. Okay. Okay. What the falsificationist is ultimately going to say is that in science we should be trying to falsify our theories, correct? 
um, or or at least positive statements that are falsifiable. But sure, yeah. Right. Um, I'll see. No, I feel like I'm going way too off track here because we're gonna. Because originally, what I was trying to, uh, yeah, I. We can well, get might, this might be this might be ultimately relevant. Like, if we find something that we can't agree yes, on here, okay. this might be so the reason you're fine why. With sort of diverging and going. Yeah. Off the so, path like, and from back. based on what you've described so far, it sounds like I would be a hardcore logical positivist. Okay. That I, I would make the argument that um, any statement that is unfalsifiable is just wholly unworthy of consideration. That it's just it's not okay. an interesting statement that I would ever care to to dissect or anything. Okay. Uh, okay. So let, let's leave that there for a second, and let me introduce to you sort of a new line of thinking okay. uh, about scientific progress, because this is going to tie right into uh, my view on morality and why objective morality is a necessity if we're going to do anything in the world. Okay. Um, so when we talk about scientific progress, if you had to map scientific progress like on a graph where the x-axis is time and y is our level of knowledge about the world, how do you think you'd graph that? Time? Um, well, are we talking like... Um, like um, it's really hard to answer this. Wait, so you're saying we've got time on one axis and technological process progress on another axis? Yeah, progress. Um, Scientific progress, our, our empirical understanding of the way that the world works. I mean, you could wrestle with this in so many different ways. Like, on, on one hand, you know, I, I would argue that this would be something that would... Um, fuck, I forgot in calc. There are names for, like, all these types of curves. I drew it on stream, but it would be something that, like, increases slowly, and then over the past, you know, whatever, like, right. has exponentially so, like, increased. In the Dark Ages, it would be a little bit... The, the slope would be... You know, flatter, quite a lot less sleep or steep than in modern day. And right now, we'd probably be on like a the, the highest, curve. yeah, something right. like that. Yeah, um, I, I could see one argument for that, but then I could also see some arguments as people saying that like the discovery of agriculture was something that was monumentally huge, more important than say the discovery of the smartphone. That that wouldn't even like compare. So like, but yeah. So but I'll, I'll answer with the exponential curve. Because that seems to be the most reasonable answer, but I could see other answers there, but I don't know how relevant that is. Sorry. Okay. Okay. I, I just PM'd you in Discord an image of the classical Popperian view about uh, scientific progress. And I, I know that there's going to be different... Cur- it doesn't really matter how linear that is. It's just mm-hmm. your picture would be something similar to that. And let me show you my personal view of how scientific progress has looked like. And in general, the almost universally accepted view in the philosophy of science as well is this kind of image. Which might seem really counterintuitive at first. Like, how is that possible? Um, But I 100% agree with it. And the Kuhn one? Yes, the Kuhn one. Um, And so you can obviously see the difference there. so what Kuhn describes in his book, uh, uh, Scientific Revolutions, it's essentially about how whenever we undergo a huge paradigm shift, and that means something going from, like, for example... Agriculture uh, or the printing press age or cars or whatever, right? I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't think about, like, technological advancements in the sense. I think about the actual way we approach science. So something like telemic astro- astronomy versus... Uh, Copernican, like the Copernican revolution, oh, actually we revolve around the sun, blah, blah, blah. Or the best example would be going from Newtonian mechanics to something like uh, general relativity. Okay. Completely, it, it's a completely new theory about the way that the world works. Um, and Kuhn essentially says that every time we undergo this scientific revolution, uh, we give up all the knowledge that we've achieved about the world and we have to completely start over. Ooh, and the reason why... I, or you can justify that, but I'm very much in disagreement with that. But sorry, go ahead. Right. Well, if we look at the actual axioms of these paradigm systems, if we look at the axioms of Newtonian mechanics, uh-huh. they are completely different than those of general relativity. Sure. You can't absorb uh, the theories that we've gained from Newtonian mechanics and just plug it into general relativity. It doesn't work that way. Yes, you can adapt them, you can adjust them, modify them to make them just as predictive and accurate as they were previously, but it doesn't just transfer like that. For example, mass in Newtonian mechanics means something completely different than mass in general relativity. Um, Mass is something that can, you know, it speeds up 
and mass is just a constant in uh, in uh, in the Newtonian mechanics picture. And okay. that might be a bit off or whatever, but that's sort of generally the gist of things. And what Kuhn wants to argue uh, is that because of these paradigm shifts, really at the root of everything, science is very much a subjective discipline. Uh, and this is also my view. I think people like to say science is uh, objective, right? Uh, it's, it, it's really just a real representation of the way that the world is. And I sort of got into this last time when the I was talking about... The anti-scientific realism or whatever. Shit. Yeah, and I got a lot of shit <laughs> about that <laughs> on your subreddit. I got links to... Yeah, don't worry about it. You're going to know that shit. <laughs> it was just very funny to me because people weren't really understanding Yeah, we're what missing I, the point. Yeah, I understand. People, but to viewers that are listening, I think people should understand that when I say that, a sentence like, you know, the electron... or an electron actually exists, why that isn't a completely true statement uh, is because ultimately you can create a very similar hypothesis where you just add a conjunction to that hypothesis uh, or say that there is something like an electron that exhibits the same properties that it does, but it may not be an electron. They're empirically added sure. the exact same. Okay. But and what I'm trying to say is that I'm not trying to say that science is a useless you know, field of inquiry and that we shouldn't be doing science. No, scientists, people should be going into science. It's, we need more scientists more than anything else right now. Absolutely. Uh, but really, uh, okay. Well, yeah. Let's just let's focus on like one statement at a time. So we don't get too lost. So the first okay, one yeah. is that anytime a paradigm shift happens, um, yes. all of the old knowledge um, is not really applicable to the new knowledge when the when new a paradigm, paradigm shift yeah. occurs. Okay, and I can I can agree with that. Okay, sure. Okay, uh, and so the Popperian currently is operating within this field of scientific inquiry where he says that we should be constantly trying to falsify our current statements and if you look at our graph if you look at our our Kuhnian map right here you'll see that there are you know there are periods of times where we don't undergo paradigm shifts for around a hundred no 200 to 300 years we operated solely within Newtonian mechanics and yeah you had little people bringing up what Kuhn calls anomalies within the system like oh this thing can't really be explained by Newtonian mechanics blah blah you know he essentially says that we gain more and more and more anomalies within our system and eventually we're forced to give it up for something new because it's going to allow us to have a more accurate representation of the world but it is within uh, these paradigms that we conduct normal science, which is, you know, creating technological advances, you know, creating medicines, creating vaccines, mm -hmm. you know, creating MRI machines. Okay. But Popper's picture is that we should be constantly trying to falsify every theory about the world that we have. The scientist's duty as a scientist is to falsify our theories. And I, I take issue room. with that statement without it being elaborated more. I'm sorry, I just don't want to let too many statements, too many premises build, and then I'm, like, lost. So, right, right. can you elaborate on that? I don't agree that anybody views, unless it's in some different way you mean it, I don't think that a scientist's job is to falsify everything. Um, oh, I, I'm saying this is Popper's view. It might not be your view. I, I'm not okay, trying to... Let me, let, me be more, let, me, let me be more, more firm on that. I don't think that any reasonable scientific person thinks that their job is solely to falsify existing knowledge. Right. It's to, you know, uh, work within our realm of science and try to create new technology. Sure. Or, or even more uh, theoretically to verify our existing models, right? Um, for instance, well, when LHC... that would be done by falsification. Well, okay. I guess maybe the way that you use falsification here, like, would you say that if you set out to confirm something is true, that's also a form of falsification? Yeah, you're trying to falsify the initial hypothesis. Okay. So when, so when the LHC is created, right, and they, and they test for the existence of the Higgs boson, boson, yep. boson, you, that's yep. that seeking the exist the um, verification that that particle exists. You would consider that to be oh. a falsification attempt. I, I should go in and elaborate. There are two two forms of positivism here uh, between uh, between verificationism and falsificationism. The verificationists say that we should aim to verify statements. The falsificationist uh, falsif or hypotheses. The falsificationist says that we should try to falsify. Hypotheses. This seems like a strange binary because I feel like most people agree with both of those statements. 
No, you can't have both. It's impossible. It becomes okay. logically inconsistent. Gotcha. So I, I just I have a semantic misunderstanding that I'm not understanding something about these statements then. Right. So if I let let let's talk about verificationism, for okay. example. Sure. Early proponents, anyone interested in doing some reading, AJ Iyer, Schlick, the founder of the Vienna Circle, it's essentially uh, a statement is going to be meaningful if it is, I mean, there are two forms of verification. There's the strong version and the weak version. The initial uh, version of verificationism was that in order for a statement to be meaningful, you have to be able to actually verify it. And you can see the actual issue with this immediately because think about statements like, Alexander the Great had a nephew named Bob, okay? I mean, we want to say that's a meaningful statement, but because it's happened in the past, we can't actually verify that statement. It's impossible. Well, but, if, we it, but if it can't be ver Okay, oof, these examples, I feel like, are hurting you because if you can't verify that statement, then I would argue that it is a meaningless statement. Unless okay, you're what about a statement like... Um, uh, there was a war in, the, in 1812 between America and the British Dominions. You can't verify that either. So clearly, Wait, the can't whole we? Subject. With, like, records and... It, so for something to be verified, it has to be observationally uh, uh, verified. And this goes into pretty complex terminology, but the verification is essentially restricts all obs observe, uh, observation sentences to either logical connectives, so things like and, or, if, then, there exists an element like... Uh, Wait, but then this person could never believe in any historical statement ever, no? Correct, correct, yeah. And I'm so, trying to say that that's why people ditched that form, and they went to the weak form of verification. I'm just giving, like, a little rundown. Oh, oh okay, of okay, the weak versus strong. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, okay. and then, so the weak component of verificationism says that a statement is meaningful if and only if it is, in principle, uh, verifiable. So there's some logical possibility that I could have verified that. I could have gone back in time and met Alexander the Great, and he could tell me, no, I don't have a nephew. In fact, I don't, I, I can't have sex or something like that, right? And boom, we've, you know, we have a way to rule out that possibility, and there you go. Okay. It's clearly false. Uh, and that's what the, that's what verificationism is. Falsification says that uh, uh, a statement or a hypothesis is meaningful if and only if we can possibly falsify it. Uh, and the reason why they wanted to do this is because for statements, for verification, it's, it's impossible uh, to consider general statements uh, as being meaningful. Like a statement such as all men are mortal, it's impossible, even logically, to verify a statement like that. So seemingly we have to give up our claims about the way the world works because any sort of universal statement uh, or general statement uh, becomes meaningless. A statement, any any sort of scientific laws, they become meaningless. Well, I don't think that... Mm, I, I feel like you can still live with that. Like, um, This is going to sound like a really strange caveat, and maybe Kawhi could speak to this better, but I think that like most physicists would agree that you could possibly construct another universe where the laws of physics are different, or it might be possible in some part of our unobserved universe where, where the laws of physics are different, but we assume that they function the same everywhere for probabilistic reasons. Like, they, all of our observations thus far have been correct, so we have no reason to believe that. But, I, for instance, like, I don't think, um, like, I don't think the, and I could be wrong on this, but I don't think that, like, the strongest physicist would say something like, I will confidently assert that 100% our, um, our laws of physics are uniform throughout the entire possible, even the known universe i don't know like if a physicist would make that statement or would even or would even care to make that statement or would even care to comment on it because it because it's a meaningless statement no or do you think that's not fair of me to say that i don't think it's fair of you to say that because i think underlying that claim is really a claim about what is meaningful and what isn't so it sort of becomes circular if you're trying oh, sure. to argue well yeah i mean i guess i would argue that a statement like that is is by definition meaningless i guess would be my my what i would feel well, uh, historically, the Vienna Circle, the logical positivist, said, okay, let's do away with verificationism and go to falsificationism, because we can falsify general statements and scientific laws. And that's why they shifted to falsificationism, because, you know, you don't run into issues like that. Um, and for a variety of reasons, falsificationism was also abandoned in, for an even more complex form of logical positivism. Uh, but ultimately, you know, like I said, logical positivism is largely dead because of 
I mean, I can tell you why, like the most famous objection to logical positivism, it's Goodman's objection. And it's, I think, the most interesting thought experiment in philosophy, actually. And it's yeah, called... Yeah, hit me up with it. It's called the... I think it's called the Gru hypothesis. Let me pull it up. Yes. Goodman's new rill of induction. You can probably Google that even. Um, and there's a perfect... Uh, yes. Goodman defined Gru relative to an arbitrary but fixed time T as follows. An object is Gru if and all. It's probably better if you read it yourself. Okay. Um, Do you want to link me in the thing and all? Yeah, sure. Um... People ask in the chat who I am. Um, I'm a I'm a philosophy specialist. Specialist now. Oof. Well, that's that's what it's called here. I guess it's called major in America. Oh, okay. Wait, um, where are you from again? Are you Canadian? I'm Canadian. Yeah. yeah okay, gotcha. I, I think there are uh, my program, anyways. is called you do like a philosophy specialization or a philosophy and mathematics specialization. Gotcha. Okay. Goodman defined Gru relative to an arbitrary but fixed time T as follows. An object is Gru if and only if it is observed before T and is green or else is not so observed and is blue. An object is Bleen if and only if it is observed before T and is blue <laughs> or else it is not so observed and is green. Why can't we just use real colors? <laughs> is that Because it's the whole point about... It's this, that's sure. the whole point. To understand the problem that Goodman posed, it is helpful to imagine some arbitrary future time, say T, January 1st, 2028. For all green things we observe up to time T, such as emeralds and well-watered grass, so both the predictive green and grew applies. Likewise, for all blue things we observe up to time T, such as bluebirds or blue flowers, both the predictive blue and bleen apply. On January 2nd, 2028, however, emeralds and well-watered bleen and bluebirds or blue flowers are grew. Clearly, the predicates green and Grew and Bleen are not the kinds of predicates we use in everyday life or in science, but the problem is that they apply in just the same way as up until some future time. T, from our current perspective, how can we say which pred predicates are more projectable into the future? Right. So if I if any sort of hypothesis can be combined with some random conjunction and be just as valid. Uh, and what this ultimately does is it completely shatters what we call the logical... Um, view of induction and you know the scientific well, like, method i feel like it's just in, in in looking at this and giving my gut reaction like it feels like a fun logic problem but is no, it possible no. can you give me like a single way that this would be applicable to any statement quantum mechanics quantum mechanics bayesian quantum mechanics was born out of the new world of induction okay what bayesian. about like a what about like a macro level thing that i would understand um just I think people think that the scientific method is something that has stayed constant over a period of time. Uh, and a lot of people think that philosophy is very much useful in the realm of science. Uh, but the question of what is evidence for a theory ha was a hugely hotly contested debate for a hundred years, and it still is. W what should we consider evidence for a theory? There's something called the Raven's Paradox, which is so applicable to science, it's not even funny. If I have the, I ha if I have the hypothesis, all ravens are black, seemingly a black raven is going to uh er, yeah a raven that is black is going to support my claim that all ravens are black however if i find a non black non raven so like a red shoe that also supports my hypothesis that all ravens are black I and guess it's just like the reason why I just don't like this thought process so much is because that doesn't seem like a meaningful statement that like a scientist would make. Like, I don't know, like if a biologist would ever make the statement, all ravens are black, but rather a statement that's more akin to like ravens are almost predominantly or are predominantly black because of this reason. If you modify this or this or this, it's possible that the species species or whatever file, I don't know, whatever the fuck you call it, that we identify as a raven could also be another color. Like, I feel like those would be more in line. This is why I'm, I'm trying to find like, can you give me one statement something that i would think is like a logical statement like this is a totally true statement um it's sound and valid and then you and then you get or, or just a statement i guess sorry i can't be sound about but like you give me like a logical statement and then you apply this thinking to it and then i'm like oh shit like oh well i guess you're right like this totally makes it so this statement falls apart like something that doesn't involve like a, a super absurd hypothetical and a super absurd sure. conditional statement sure uh -huh. absolutely if i for example say like einstein's theory of special relativity um <laughs> okay well okay go ahead finish it go ahead 
Oh, oh you want, okay. Well, I'm gonna say, like, can you give me like a statement that's not like a really esoteric, like an so ultra- you, you want in like, between really simple and complicated. Well, you can give me something simple too, but just something that's like meaningful. Like I would never imagine like all ravens are black is going to be like a hugely, like something that I can't, I can like, give me something that fails in my logic system. Cause I feel like that's something that I, in my current logic system, I could reconcile. Like I would just never make the statement, all ravens are black. I would say like ravens tend to be black or most ravens are black. And, and that would solve that and still be consistent with everything I know to be true about ravens. Or right, if I was a biologist, I would imagine. Um, but you you can try the sure. I, you can try the Ein, Einstein statement. Go for that. Well, if you well no, no, no. That I agree that is a bit too complex. But okay, let's consider a hypothesis that might be false and probably is false. But for okay. example, the statement: uh, all Democratic voters will vote for a Democratic candidate. Okay, obviously that's we know that's a false statement, but that's besides the question. Okay. Um, so. For example, what would be a piece of evidence that supports that hypothesis? Well, clearly, a Democratic voter who did vote for a Democratic candidate, right? Okay. But we can modify the logical structure of all, um, if we're just using basic logic, which mm -hmm. is the underpinning of mathematics, of, you know, of, of our entire language, um, we can modify the statement that all... Uh, all Democrats will vote for a Democratic uh, candidate by uh, switching it to be that, uh, oh, what is it? Um, actually, I might be able to also just link you this. Uh, anyways, it's, it's saying that all Ravens, or all Democrats vote for Democratic, sorry, I'm getting mixed up in my words. Okay. By saying that all Democrats uh -huh. vote for a Democratic candidate, that is equivalent to saying that if someone is not a Democrat, they will not vote for a Democratic candidate. Wait, logically? Those, I don't think those statements are equivalent. I have to, let me write it down. Yeah, because, this because saying all, you, if you say that only Democrats will vote, if only, only Democrats and all Democrats will vote for a Democratic candidate, then that would mean that any non-Democrat would not. Okay, it, yes. Yeah. I've written it down. Here we go. Okay. All Democrats will mm -hmm. vote for a Democratic candidate or or vote for a Democratic candidate. Okay. If someone is not a Democrat, okay. uh, sorry, if someone has not voted for a Democratic candidate, then they are not a Democrat. There we go. Correct. Okay. <laughs> Took me a while, but I got it. Thank God. Okay. Okay. So let's see if we have these, you know, two, let's call them equations. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll see that the first one is satisfied by someone who is a Democrat and has voted for a Democratic candidate. Okay. But notice that that second uh, equation is satisfied by someone who didn't vote for a Democratic candidate and isn't a Democrat. Okay. And those are logically equivalent hypotheses and they are supported by the exact same evidence. So it seems that, you know, a Republican who voted for uh, Ted Cruz equally supports my hypothesis yeah. that all Democrats vote for a Democratic candidate. Okay. And this was an issue for like 30, it still is an issue, really. It's been more resolved now as we've moved to a subjective interpretation of probability. But this paradox. Wait, 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 wait. What's the paradox that's being created here? I don't understand. That it's a lot easier to explain in terms of red ra or black ravens. <laughs> I've said it so often. But okay. basically, a red shoe uh -huh. equally supports my hypothesis that, you know, a raven is black just as much as a black raven does. Does that really make any sense to you? Well, hey, no, Jim, because you're not I've saying that you're not saying... Hypothesis. I've got a red boot, right? I I guess my problem is that... <laughs> I like the Democrat problem because this is a, this is something that could be rooted in data that we okay, can sure. and talk about. Because, because, like, no... The problem I'm running into is that no reasonable person, it sounds, would make the statements that you're using as our, like, logical arguments here. Like, nobody would make the statement that all ravens are black... Um, and like this is like a statement that needs okay. to be like tested or verified or falsified. Like this is okay, what I mean when I say that. I, like, I'm writing like, down. Like, yeah, sure. I'm writing down the equation so I don't stumble over my words here. Okay. Yeah. Like this is where like um, 
like like a trolley problem, right, is a really good question to make you second guess your moral philosophy because this is a highly applicable. Um, I can draw parallels to many real life things. Would you um, would you pull one lever to kill one person to save four? Would you push somebody in front of the train tracks to kill four people? Well, if you right. answer no to that, well, what about um, or if you answer yes to that, what about killing somebody to harvest their organs? Well, these are very real, very applicable. Like, okay, well, I can immediately see the consequence uh, of my moral system here, and it's an interesting question to think about. But like these statements of like all ravens are black like no reasonable person would ever make this statement so it's like it just seems like a really like it's an interesting logic problem to think about where we can like hardcore analyze some very 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 simplistic forms of logic but no scientific statement it seems in the real world like ever functions this way like no scientist like publishes a paper saying here's my logic statement all ravens are black and then like let's argue philosophy about it I mean, they're, they're, thought, they're both thought experiments. I completely disagree with, because if you want, you can you know, transfer this to an everyday case like the democratic problem. The reason that we use the Ravens example is because it's easy. It doesn't require me stumbling over my words, <laughs> sure. et cetera. Right? I, guess I, I can create because a that... really convoluted, like for example, uh-huh. the trolley problem, when does that ever come up in real life? It doesn't. Tons it's, of it's, times. Oh, we no, 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 we no. Co- modified no, no, no. versions. Modified of versions of it. But when I, but the problem is that, like, when I ask you for a modified version of the Raven problem, it seems like the reason why you run into a difficulty is because you realize the absurdity of the question that we would never. No, no? no. The reason I come into a difficulty with it is because I'm really not all that great at thinking on the spot. I, I, I would struggle to come up with a sure. modified version of the trolley problem. Really, I think you could. I um. Think- well, but now you might not do it just to prove me wrong. But like, I, but again, like I feel I don't understand. I feel like you're trying to. I I don't see the relevance of this at all because ultimately I've given you an example that is very much relevant. Well, I guess like the problem is that so I use a form. I guess I would be a logical positivist and that I want things to be falsifiable when I make statements. And when I think of this, I'm thinking of very relevant questions such as like, does God exist? Do ghosts exist? Um, are, do people have spirits or whatever? Right. So these are questions that are generally unfalsifiable and for reasons very relevant to the real world. I consider them not considerable, that we shouldn't spend time considering these things. So when you challenge my thought system, you're challenging me and you're saying that I think that your view of the world is wrong. Here is why. And then I go, okay, that's interesting. Can you posit me a question that I should be reconsidering? And then you say, okay, well, what about the statement, all ravens are black? It's like, this is a statement that in my current thought process, I would never make. So it's like, what is the relevance to this statement and making me analyze my, and this might just be my inability to understand or fully grasp your analogy too, but it's like, this is the problem that I'm having right now because all of the statements that you're giving me that fall apart under logical positivism are statements that I would never make being a logically positivist person I guess okay look when a scientist Uh is being taught science okay and they at the very foundation of the scientific method is this theory that we can take real world uh, observational sentences and Mm -hmm. use them as evidence for certain hypotheses sure but all of that immediately follow, falls apart if we don't have a definitive understanding of what the word evidence means, what gets to be evidence, and what doesn't get to be evidence. Okay. And the initial uh, response to this question was that, okay, well, anything that satisfies the hypothesis is obviously evidence for the theory. But what this Raven's paradox shows is that something like a red boot is just as much evidence well, for the hypothesis that you, all ravens are black. Couldn't you also, under the same logically positivist thing, um, test for like a null hypothesis as well? Like, um, So let me give another thought experiment, okay? And this is one that I've heard before, okay? So let's say that I'm thinking of a pattern of numbers, okay? Or I've got a pattern in my head, okay? And my pattern, um, the numbers that I generate with this pattern is 10, 20, and 40. I want you to give me new patterns, and then I'll tell you if it matches the internal pattern and then you you guess the pattern and I'll tell you if you're right or wrong, right? So I say 10, 20, 40. Somebody will likely guess the pattern um, 20, 40, 80 and I'll say that matches the pattern and then they'll guess the pattern. Okay, well, it must be doubling the number every time and then I'll say they're wrong and then we play this game for an hour or whatever and then eventually... um, you know, even though all of your things are confirming your incorrect hypothesis, when you, um, if you try to test the null hypothesis, so say you do like a decreasing order of numbers, I'll say it's wrong. Well, now you get closer to like a, a true statement, right? And eventually the pattern is like, it's just increasing numbers. That's it. There's nothing, 
um, greater than that. But I, but you could still arrive at that even though you are testing a hypothesis with um, with, with even though you're testing a, a pattern with, like the wrong hypothesis in mind, you can still use logical positivism to eventually verify your hypothesis. No, am I totally lost here? Does that make sense? What I'm saying or I almost have no idea what you just said. I think you very much missed the whole point of the okay. Raven's paradox, which is essentially to call into question what scientists and philosophers of science have generally regarded as evidence. I, I guess, know? like my my problem is, like, let's say I make the statement, um, oh, things oh, drop, look, look, things dropped look. fall, right? This is like all ravens are black, and then you would say, okay, well, everything that you drop that falls, no, verify- no, that's it's not the same because. Okay. In our contemporary usage of language, uh, when something falls, it analytically, by Trolley definition, problem. is dropped. Y-A-Y-Y. Those are synonyms. Okay? And that's an analytic statement. Okay, where, okay I'm sorry. What about if you hold something up and let go of it, it will fall? How about that? Uh, sure. Okay. So, but I you're mean, saying that, like, I can't, I'm, I'm not allowed to generalize this if I observe it in all cases? Well, no, look, or... if, if you, if you want to use that example, that's perfectly fine. That would mean that every time I don't drop something, I'm technically uh, providing evidence for that statement. I am. I'm absolutely. Because, of, so what was your, what was that hypothesis? Okay, so if I let go of something, it will fall. I go. So, so all things that are let go will fall things that are let go and then i would obviously modify the fuck out of the statement so all things that aren't levitating or being like propulsion like jet propulsion yes, or floating yes. through the air or something like that right and like not a bird or whatever okay so we can restate all things that are let go will fall as if something does not fall it is not let go and so let's look at these two statements what will satisfy as evidence for all things that are let go will fall? Well, clearly, something that is both let go and falls. What satisfies if something does not fall, it is not let go? Well, clearly, something that is not falling and has not been let go of. So if I am holding a pencil, okay. this is just as much evidence for your hypothesis that all things that are let go will fall as me letting go of a golf ball and watching it fall to the floor. Wait, so why are those two things equivalent? Because they are logically equivalent statements. I can, look, if S, or if L, then F, that's how I have it written here. Okay. That is logically equivalent to if not F, then not L. You can pull out a, a philosophical truth table and, you know, you Wait, can Wait, is that actually true? If L then wouldn't you have to modify the statement with if and only if L, then F? Don't no. you? I, I, I'm, I don't. Oh, hold on. I'll, no, I'll I don't. I, no, no. I, this can't be correct. If it L, correct. then F. If not F, then not L. No way. I, I've just sent you the, the thing. If L, then F. I can't believe this. So let's say that um, if... Um, if strong, then policeman. If you're not a if you're not a policeman, then you're not strong. Or wait, hold on, wait. Maybe that is hold on. Wait. If L. Wait. Hold I, on. I think it, it might be completely true. Hold on. Let me just like yes, let this sink in. True. Hold on. Yeah. Hold on. I mean, this is the basic tenet of a material conditional. Okay. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If yeah. the, the 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 if word, I read a really retarded logic problem like two day like or like three weeks ago with some stupid shit, and it fucked my head because they were using statements differently than I'm used to seeing them. Okay, right. if means if and only if, right? Are, are those two? No, things? no, it's not. They're two totally different things. If and only if is it's you know a necessary condition back and forth if. So, for example, if I say, if P, then Q, that is true in three different scenarios and is false in one. It is true if P is true and Q is true. It is true if P is false and Q is false. And it is true if P is false and Q is true. The only case where it is false is if P is 
true and Q is false. I mean, do you want me, I can pull up the logic table for you. Table. No, I, I understand. Yeah, and then where's if and only if? Yeah, if and only if is uh, equivalence. Yeah, never mind. Okay, I think I understand. Okay. So if we use strong and policeman, if someone's strong, then they're a policeman. Mm -hmm. That means that all strong Evidence. people are policemen? Is that an equivalent statement or no? So, no, you can go from a, uni we call this universal induction. Okay. You can go from a statement like, for all policemen, or for all X, if X is a policeman, then they are strong. Okay. Then they are strong. Okay. That means that not all strong people are and policemen. And for that, you can go, if you are a policeman, then you are strong. That's, you can carry from that universal hypothesis to the material conditional and a, evidence for that hypothesis will be a policeman who is strong right or someone who's not a policeman who's not strong exactly okay. exactly that's what the raven's paradox is saying and that is very unintuitive so if i'm a scientist uh who is wanting to or if i'm a political wait, 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 scientist, real quick real quick yeah. would, would testing that this opposite statement is considered, is that considered the contrapositive? Uh, yes. Okay. That is what it's, uh, it that is, is called. Testing? No, it, con it's by contraposition, they are equivalent to each other. Yes. Okay. So when you test the contrapositive statement, is mm -hmm. that the same thing as testing the null hypothesis? Yes. Uh, null hypothesis? Sorry. What do you mean by null hypothesis? Like, um, that the, hold on, let me make sure I have all this shit right. It's a general statement or default position that there is no relationship between two measured phenomenon or no association among groups. Like, so... If I say that if you're strong, then you're a policeman, I want to find... How, how, would you, how would you test the null hypothesis? By trying to find a policeman who isn't strong or by trying to find somebody who's strong that isn't a policeman? Which one of, the, one of these is considered the null hypo hypothesis? No? Uh, I, I think you've gone a bit into statistics and statistical hypothesis testing, which is already past this sort of timeline well, that we're yeah, operating. Yeah, sure. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just trying to. I'm just trying to figure out how this. There, fits. There's no null hypothesis in this. No, no, no. Just, in this, there's not. No, 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 no. Yeah, this is totally not related to logical statements. I understand that. I'm just trying to think of um, okay. in, in terms of because part of testing for a valid hypothesis is also testing the null hypothesis to make sure that the correlation that you found actually exists and it doesn't just exist everywhere and you're fucking yourself or something. Um, but uh, but if you're not familiar with this, okay, never mind. Um, okay. But anyways, the ultimate point is that if I'm a political scientist, going back to our Democratic candidate example, okay. Um, if I'm the political scientist and I'm overseeing a group of people, I don't want one of them to come up to me and say, hey, just got new evidence for your hypothesis, boss. I found a Republican who voted for Ted Cruz. We've just got more evidence for your hypothesis. I'd rather someone come up to me saying, oh, hey, I just found this Democrat. He says that he voted for uh, Hillary Clinton. But in the scientific process, aren't both of those things like almost, I don't want to say equally. Well, yeah, like equally important. Uh, really are they do we really want to so let's say we go back to that one statement our one <laughs> convoluted hypothesis our, our, so our one convoluted statement we say that all people that voted for obama are democrats is that what we're saying that all people that voted for a democrat are democrats that, uh, all people that are democrats all that people that are democrats, themselves democrats yeah voted for a democratic candidate all people that are democrats voted, voted for, for a democratic, a democratic candidate, candidate. Which is clearly a false statement. We know that, but that's that's fine. No, 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 but just for sake of our argument, yeah, I understand. Yes. I'm not being um, pedantic, um, yeah. or not pedantic. I'm not being uh, dense. Okay, so if you are a Democrat, if you're a Democrat, then you vote for a Democratic candidate, right? That's our if then statement, mm -hmm. right? So uh, if you are not a Democrat, then you did not vote for a Democratic candidate. Yeah. So like, mm -hmm, let mm -mm, mm -mm. no other way around. If, if you're you not. Didn't, Oh, wait, if you didn't vote for a Democratic candidate, then Democratic you're not candidate. a Democrat, right? Yes, that is the equivalent, yeah. Okay, so then if we were to test every single Democrat in the United States, 
and all of them voted Democrat. Isn't this not enough information to prove our hypothesis? Don't we need to test non-Democrats to make sure that it's still true? Wouldn't that um, be? Wouldn't a normal scientist agree to that? That you would need to test that to make sure that you don't have a spurious correlation? I shouldn't use these words, but to, to, okay, just it, looking at the logical statement, wouldn't you have to test non-Democrats to make sure that you're finding multiple type, like that the evidence on the other side is true as well? I, I think this is this is coming out of the issue that I've chosen a very specific example in political science that actually has to do okay. with political affiliations and um it, it depends on you know what that scientist actually wants to observe but well no i would i would i would Democrats argue i would argue as the subject that every that if you're going to make the statement so the statement was the original statement was if you identify as a democrat you voted for a democratic candidate that was the original, yeah. Well, can we not use Black Ravens? This makes this so much easier to understand. And I, like, I just well, hate the Black Raven because it's such a it's such a statement that would never be made. If we could focus on a real world that. statement, you can replace that with a real problem solution if you want. I, like the one I just gave. Okay, like, we'll use Black Ravens. Okay, okay. Yes. Okay. okay. What is a the red original? shoe? Does that like? And look, this would have been a hypothesis that you know someone back in. Um, no, okay, yeah, let's just focus yeah, let's just focus on the ravens. So a red shoe is evidence that all ravens are black? Black, yes. Okay, so the original statement is all, all ravens, ravens are, black. are black. Yes. Yep. So the original statement is all ravens are black. So yeah. if raven, then black. If raven, they are raven, then they then are black. black. And if you're not a raven, then, then you're not black. Yes. So if I find those are something, logically equivalent. Yeah. So if I find something that's red, and it say it's a shoe, I know that it's not a raven. Yeah. That these are equivalent statements. Okay. Yes. What if I? Okay. Can I challenge that even though these two logical statements might be true, they don't have the same level of relevance to the the question I'm trying to answer. Well, well, uh, look, the only reason I brought this up is because people like there are people that think that, you know, philosophy of science doesn't really have all that much to do with science in the end. But it's not true, because for a long time, the scientific method operated under this assumption that they are the same, that, you know, uh, for, under their logical structure, a red shoe would support the theory. And clearly, we don't really want this. And so some responses were, okay, let's just bite that bullet. Um, and we'll just appeal to usefulness. We'll appeal to pragmatism. But clearly, that's a, that's a moral statement. That is a non-epistemic value that you're bringing into science. And a lot of scientists don't like that. They don't like to think that they're ever operating um, within a normative discipline. Sure. And I would really... Okay, so before we do this again sometime, yeah. if you could find a way to like take some time and think about how this would apply to like a real-world statement, I would love to think about this in those terms. I feel like it would help me. Maybe I'm just okay, not here. capable here. of... I, I, have, I, have a well, I don't like to like, put it. you on the spot for no, it. No, 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 no. Like, look... Okay. Ultimately, my entire belief here, underlying all of the philosophy of science, is that science is a subjective discipline built entirely around morality, and built entirely around normativity. Uh, and this is why I have such a serious issue with you saying that there is no objective morality, or that you're a motivist, and that there's no truth value to morality. Because what that leads to is complete nihilism about everything. I think you can I think you can escape nihilism well, well, let me, let without me. needing to say that everything including science is normative. Well, look, let, let okay, me okay. explain the argument. Um, so like let's look at a, a scientific example. Um, for example, let me that was bad English. But so in science, let us say I am testing the Let's see. If I'm working, for example, I think this was Levi's example. If I am within a or operating within a belt factory, okay? Okay. And I am trying to figure out the fail ratio uh, for these belts, what percentage of them will fail, okay? And what is going to be required 
uh, for them to fail. Uh, that in itself, th that is a hypothesis. I'm going to say 0.1% of them will fail, and then we can move on and ship them out, okay? That is, if you then contrast that with someone working in a, you know, in a medical research lab and developing vaccines, their, uh, their, their fail ratio is going to be extremely different than uh, someone working in a belt factory. Okay, because you're bringing in a moral uh, evaluation uh, into science by doing that. You're saying that in order for us to ship out these vaccines, there has to be a fail rate of 0.000001% or even lower, probably. Okay. But if you're working within a belt factory, your fail ratio is going to be significantly different. Now, okay. the natural objection to this uh, is Rudner's objection. And he says, well, that's just one type of hypothesis that happens in science. And ultimately, it really isn't relative. Uh, I'm seeing on your screen now, how do you feel about the incommensurability? Oh, wait, I, that's a question someone else had. Just but, but finish this. Okay. Then... Uh, but clearly, that is in itself a value judgment in, uh, in science. Uh, and Rudner's objection is, well, that's just one type. So, yes, sometimes a scientist does make... Okay, well, hold on. Okay, okay, okay hold on. Okay, let's deal with this. For so, I would argue that a scientist would isn't responsible for making these types of judgments. These are judgments okay. that are made by politicians or, okay. or, f or judgments of philosophy. Like, what now, science can answer what is the failure rate of a particular medicine or mm -hmm. what is the failure rate of a belt. Mm -hmm. But science could... I would argue that science can't answer what is the acceptable fail mm -hmm. rate of either of these things no that would be my I, exactly i totally agree with you and so i would say my response to levi would be saying well the scientists when they're conducting a hypothesis like that they're not really acting scientists qua scientists they're not acting as a scientist in that sense they're acting as an individual of the community as uh, as a politician as someone who's looking out for the rest of humanity you know as opposed to what you know science has uh typically designated as their realm of discipline. Now, before I go to the next step, uh, what is that question? Because I love the incommensurability. Of How paradigms. do you feel about the incommensurability of Coombs paradigms? What does incommensurability mean? Um, I love, I wrote a, a paper on, um, so put simply, this sort of went back to my statement about well, let's see, what's the easiest way to put this? So within the realm of science, there were these two competing worldviews, as I said, the Popperian picture about how scientists should act and the Kuhnian picture about how scientists should act. And the Popperian picture was, okay, we should try to falsify our theories and to achieve uh, to achieve at a, a greater, um, like a greater notion of the way that the world works, have a more accurate picture about how the world works. Uh, the Kuhnian picture was that really we can never actually do that because underlying all of our paradigms is a completely different uh, set of vocabulary, uh, set of words that designate very different things. So my example about mass in Newtonian mechanics versus Einstein's theory of relativity is a clear example of this. And there's something called a I think it just alt shift, uh, where ultimately someone's notion of a word shifts so as to mean something different in a different paradigm. And it's very much like a political shift. And so the shift from Newtonian mechanics to uh, the theory of relativity was actually almost like a political shift as opposed to a shift about you know the way that truth works. Because if we actually think about it, if we look at the historical record uh, about scientific progress, the Popperian picture, it, it doesn't work. It, it, it doesn't account for the way uh, that scientists have operated, and the Kuhnian picture is very much reflective of that. Take, for example, uh, during the, you know, the fight between Copernicus and people who aren't Copernicus, uh, you had Ptolemic uh, astronomy versus Copernican uh, astrology. At that time, when we did shift away to the Copernican picture that the Earth does revolve around the Sun and that the Sun doesn't revolve around the Earth, 
the the fact was that actually both hypotheses were just as accurate about the world with the evidence that we had at the time. The only reason, actually, it could be argued that the idea that the Earth revolves around the sun actually had less direct evidence uh, for its case than the Ptolemic one did. But the ultimate reason why we chose to choose that hypothesis was because it was useful in making predictions about the world. So even though we didn't have a lot of evidence supporting that claim, ultimately that didn't matter. And the same thing happened with, you know, Leibniz versus Newton. Uh, quantum mechanics, or sorry, not quantum mechanics, um, Newtonian mechanics gave up any sort of explanatory reason for the reason or for why gravity works. Leibniz had a solution there. It's because of the it's because of God sustaining uh, these natural laws. It, it's God's will that we have gravity on Earth. Newtonian mechanics, there's no explanatory reason for gravity. We still don't have a reason for gravity. Although, you know, gravity, that's a very recent discovery, though. Um, but if you look at the historical record, scientists don't choose scientific hypotheses because they are more representative of the way that the world is. They choose them for a huge variety of reasons, based on the way that they were raised, uh, based on mo uh, moral values that they hold, political affiliations, religious values. And this is the way that scientists have always operated. And Kuhn argues, is that, uh, Kuhn argues that we should continue to operate in this way. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, if we just want to continue refuting every single value that the Popperian, not value, every hypothesis uh, as a Popperian says that we should, we're never going to get a lot of the stuff done in normal science, as I said. And I know you said that you're not, well, you would say that, oh, we shouldn't follow the Popperian picture exactly. We should have technological uh, evolution and, you know, we should develop vaccines and such. We shouldn't constantly be trying to undermine the very paradigm that we're working under. But that in itself is a value judgment that you're making. It's appealing to pragmatism because you recognize that under the Popperian system, we're not going to get a whole lot done. And so by even acknowledging that, you've given up the claim that science is, it's, is objective. There is very much subjectivity to it because we want to get stuff done in the world. Because if we don't, well, people are going to die. We're not going to have vaccines because we're so busy trying to figure out what the fuck is wrong with quantum mechanics that we've given up any hope of developing vaccines and medicine and new phones, new cars, ways to cure world hunger, you know, going to the moon uh, or Mars, I guess, et cetera. And those are essentially in themselves subjective opinions that people have about how we should do science. And these are moral evaluations. They're not descriptive evaluations. Um, I sort of totally went off the incommensurability of paradigms uh, partly be because um, it's a super difficult topic, and I don't know if I totally agree with Kuhn's conclusion on the incommensurability of paradigms, but it's basically that because of the way that scientists work, you can never accurately compare two scientific paradigms to each other, because at the very fundamental level, the stuff that they're talking about is totally different. And that's basically that. And ultimately, actually, if you look at Kuhn's picture, of the incommensurability of paradigms. This is his most controversial claim. He says that every time we undergo a scientific revolution, for example, from uh, Newtonian mechanics to something like general relativity, the entire world changes. The actual world shifts um, to meet the scientist's view of the world. Um, he since well, he's dead now, but after that, he tried to distance himself from that claim because that's so effed up. Uh, but, yeah, and it doesn't really make sense. But basically, I completely agree with him. I think it's a subjective discipline. I don't think you can compare two past paradigms because at the core level, they are completely different theories that utilize completely different variables and constants. And I think that Putnam's objection, the twin earth theory, uh, is easily solved by Kuhn in his, I think, 1970 work. And I'm not going to go into that because that's totally off of our topic. And there's a very long-winded example of my thoughts about the incommensurability of paradigms. Wow.
that was for like that one person who understood any of that but uh that was a um, coagulation i don't remember if you talked to him last time or not do you remember if you did when you were on here coagulation he's um, the physicist guy who also does philosophy sometimes is he on the discord server um yeah i think his name on here was like coagulation uh coagulation z or whatever i think i i think i know maybe i don't know probably not maybe i don't know uh anyways look want to go to the very core of all this i think logic and math are a subjective discipline as well because look let's look at our very basis basic laws of logic okay oh wait are we going back to the stuff that i understand now the non-consumer ability whatever (laughs) yes this is yeah I, i just i answered that because if you want to take the time and dissect all that i think you'll sort of understand my actual view but sure let's go to the laws of logic okay we say that p and not p cannot uh both be true right something can't be both black and not black okay why is that something can't be both black and not black right why is that um i guess it's the way that we define being or define black that if you are black you can't also be not black it's kind of like a binary thing or well because of the laws of logic they say so oh okay you sure know, yeah the laws of logic. P and not p okay. but why why because it's Cause accurate that's... about the world sure but I'm, I'm legitimately asking you why because this is going to show you why we have to have an objective morality okay um well, yeah why because that it. seems to be the way the that seems to be the the way laws of the universe, universe works yeah is that things can't both be something and not be something simultaneously that in- okay well i actually have my own logical system okay. i call it kun fire robins because that's my user kun fire robins logical system and uh and i think that this is the set of logic we should be using that something can be both black and not black because it makes me happy that's why i want that law why why should i choose your law over my law um because my law is better <laughs> why is yours better um okay let's let's all right let's do this okay so my law argues for logic that i can see i can observe exists in the universe and then you choose a personal law that makes you happy um i would argue the way that i would approach this conversation is i would say that to generate more happiness in the future you want to be able to make as many predictive statements as possible okay. and that your system stop. of logic stop. fails to make predictive already, statements okay yeah go ahead. okay what you've appealed to morality to justify that deductive claim you're you're appealing to morality to justify the sure. basis so my, my, of my, every my, single my, discipline yeah, yeah, on hold earth. Hold on, hold on. So my 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 appeal. So what I'm appealing to is a, 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 and Pragmatism. what pragmatism yeah is this um i don't know if you would say like this axiomatic belief that you want to be happy and that happy is a subjective we can argue about that if you want but i i guess you'll let that statement stand that every individual wants to survive and be and be happy in in whatever their definition of the word happy is so i make that assumption if you don't if we don't share that assumption then i can never have a conversation with that person sure well i mean I, i i i guess sure okay I mean, I, I think that's, I, I don't know how entirely that's relevant, but okay. I, I think, sorry, I, I do sort of see what you're saying. But sure, yes, so like on. if a person were to say, like, I like this, so like if a person were to say, like, well, I like this because it makes me feel happy, then what I would try to do is I would point out, okay, well, look at where all of this, this wave logicking statements, this form of logic will generate a whole bunch of answers that won't make you happy. Uh, so I'm, I guess I'm appealing to that person's subjective experience as a human and wanting to be happy, which is an okay, axiom that I assume that both of us share, that we we both desire personal happiness. Okay, but go ahead. justify that very... So you're, you're saying that if I don't agree with this axiom, you're ultimately not going to, te- going to you know, have a discussion with me. Well, no, I'm, I'm not that I won't, but that it's impossible to. I would, I would argue that it's impossible if you have... Because, well, because I guess at its root, I'm a nihilist, that since I don't believe in any no, sort of... Moral- no, you're, I don't think you are a nihilist. I think you're absolutely... You believe in uh, objective morality because you have this axiom here that you're saying that in order to get anything done, we all have to follow this axiom. But, I rec- but, but axiom. the difference is that axiom. I recognize that axiom is entirely arbitrary. That if somebody were to come up to me, they were to say, I enjoy cutting off my own limbs and then sticking 
sticking my infected body parts onto tree limbs and causing myself extreme pain, that if a person genuinely believed that, then I can't really tell that person they're wrong in any objective sense because my objective definition or my objective basis for surviving is as arbitrary as his objective basis for um, for torturing and killing himself, right? Is what I right. would... Okay. Okay, but look, if you are arguing against the notion of objective morality, you have to understand that... I believe ultimately that we will reach the state of nihilism that you're describing, that you're probably currently in. It's it's impossible to completely avoid nihilism. And I think sure. everyone should be able to recognize that. Okay. Because at the core of everything, it's asking, well, why should I follow this? Yeah. Why and, should and I follow ultimately, that? assuming the universe is not a planned universe with a grand creator or something, there is no Even that. Why. No, even that. You, you can't even presuppose that. Because why should I believe something like that? I think ultimately, Kagato, I think therefore I am, that's really the only thing we can be really certain of. 100% without a doubt. Okay. But you have to recognize that in order to live, in order to live a life that we want to call meaning, we have to, we have to start out somewhere. And sure. we have to set the foundations of philosophy and every other discipline. Yeah, but so what you, what you just said, though, is the worst type of motivated reasoning, right? You're saying that in order to in order for us to do something, we must construct a logic system that does this, right? Well, that doesn't make that logic system true. It just makes it convenient of for it. Of course. The, the, I, I, the, I, this is a very common misunderstanding that I think people have about logic. I think people think that logic is something you can go outside your bedroom door look at the world and find these laws of logic. Logic, it, it's just something to match our natural language. Logic is something that wasn't found. It's been crafted by people over generations. You know, this is... I feel Dick and like... Stein talk about this a lot. About wait, wait, how, wait, 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 hold on. So would you say that like the statement one plus one equals two, that that's a human construct, human constructed statement? Of course, uh, absolutely. Like because look, if you're talking about math, and this is something that a lot of people do, and it makes sense why they do it. But you have to be careful that you don't do this. You can't jump to math before we've agreed on something about logic, uh, because something, you know, the piano axioms are defined through set theory, and set theory is defined through, um, you know, uh, logical laws. Uh, at least some people would think if you're a mathematical anti-realist, you disagree with that. I think I probably disagree with that. But following the typical mathematician, they'll say that ultimately logic is the foundation of all mathematics. And I think you would actually agree with that too. But I have a very specific take on that. Sure. that I, it just, I guess what time. I'm not understanding is like, I feel like the statement like one plus one equals true is it, it can be, if all of humanity were destroyed, this statement would still be true. For instance, um, two hydrogen atoms would come together to form a molecule of hydrogen, right? I think, right? They both have one. Okay, look, let's start, let's start at the basis of okay. everything. What can we know for certain? Well, as people? As humans? As, you can't even presuppose something like people are humans. It, it's well, well you said we. Wait, so what do you... Uh, wait, so, okay, I'm sorry. Say that again. What do you ask? What can be certain in the universe? Um... I, I, it depends on how you define certain, I guess. I don't know. 100% certain. There's absolutely no hypothetical scenario that would prove it to be wrong. Uh, nothing? I, or that we exist? That I, as an individual observer, probably exist? Typically, the agreed upon is uh, that there is a thinking thing. Because if you say that I'm a thinking thing, that presupposes identity and blah, 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 blah. So usually people agree that there is a thinking thing. And ultimately, we can't go from here to anywhere else without presupposing some, you know, benevolent God, okay? And this is really the root of a lot of issues of philosophy, is where do we go from here? And so when we were talking about the logic of positivists, for example, we were, that's one appeal to getting rid of this problem, because they rule all the questions about metaphysics and, oh, what can you know before experience as utterly meaningless? Because the only thing that are, that has any meaning are things that are rooted in experience. But, you know, um, uh, people who aren't phenomenalists, you know, Hegelians and idealists uh, and Kantian transcendentalists, they're denying that, you know, the only thing we can know for certain is that is within our own mind. And really, space and time are, you know, I'm not going to go into <laughs> Kant, but uh, these are all reactions to the same issue about what can be known for certain. And if we want to go anywhere, we have to agree on a basis of logic. 
at least this is my analytic view. I'm sure there are continentalists out there that are watching this. And I know there are some people in a server that are watching that are going to disagree with me on that. But I think everyone who's a scientist or a mathematician have to agree that there are some basis, base axioms that we all agree on that we derive everything from. Uh, but you have to also recognize that these laws of logic are, they are chosen to match our natural language. The reason we say P or uh, or P and not P can't both be true is because in our natural language, it doesn't make sense. And there are forms of logic that say that P and not P can be true. There are multiple different forms of logic. The most common one is symbolic logic, but you can have paraconsistent logic, which says that P and not P can both be true. So to say that, you know, we were going out here and we're finding the way that the world is and we're creating a system based on the way that the world is, it's very wrong. Uh, all we're doing when we're deriving a logical system is trying to find out what works best for us, what is pragmatic, what is useful. And that's why the basis of everything is a very subjective decision that we're doing what is useful. Because I can equally say, well, why don't we do something that's completely not useful? Where's the, what's wrong with that? You can't presuppose saying that, oh, well, we shouldn't do something that's not useful because it's it, because that wouldn't be useful. Because that's just circular. You have to start somewhere. And you have to start with a moral claim about how we should operate. And that claim is usually some form of pragmatism. And so underlying mathematics, underlying logic, is this decision that we want to make our logical statements as reflective of the natural world as ultimately possible. Because that allows us to interact with the world successfully, create new technology. But you also have to recognize that this is a normative decision. And I think you might be getting caught up in what we're considering objective. Because, yeah, maybe that's the problem. Because I don't think I've because, disagreed with anything you said so far, that even it's a normative decision, I guess right? it's just what, our, what we call objective is... Maybe that's it's just a semantic difference? Right, because I think that once we're... I imagine almost like a bubble, okay? And outside this bubble is complete void. And we can call this void nihilism. But at the very edges of this bubble are these axioms that we all agree upon. And within those axioms, all of our de definitions, aside from nihilism, take shape. Okay. Objective means objective within that bubble. It doesn't mean objective outside that bubble. Universal means universal within this bubble. And so when people sure, talk so about like I don't morality, disagree with this at all. Why couldn't you just start off with this? Well, because I'm now going to say, so well, you can now agree with me that morality is completely objective. Sure, that, if you define objective as meaning literally the literal opposite of objective, then yeah, sure. No, it's not a literal meaning, a literal opposite of objective. I guess when I think of something that is objectively true, I think about something that is true and, and always true in every facet of the known universe, or that we believe to be true in every facet of the known universe. Look, but if, if you, you literally you... redefine objective to mean like, well, it, it's objective in the sense that like, I mean, everything outside of this is nihilism, then sure, I guess I believe in an objective morality, right? No, I, I disagree with you completely. Because okay. before we make this normative decision, to agree on these laws of logic, any statement that you make is completely meaningless. It, it's absolute garbage. And so far as philosophical statements or every statement, including scientific every ones? Statement included. If you are a nihilist, everything that happens, everything you do okay, so is completely meaningless. I don't have the tool I don't think I have the tools equipped to like necessarily dissect your statements, but like a lot of them hit me as being very, very wrong. So the in, the intuitive thing that I want to respond to with everything, um, especially when you start making statements like um, like, well, numbers are just a meme and everything is kind of just a meme that we've kind of invented. No, like, no, I, no, no. Well, no. like because that's what it sounds like. When he's like one plus one is nothing like that's just a human construct well two if every single human was destroyed two independent atoms of, of hydrogen will come together to form a molecule that is the, that one plus one being two in a nature like is something that can happen and will exist independent of any human construct unless i literally can't even fathom okay. this right okay well if you want to say that then what is the number it's just our way of counting things in the universe. I mean, so it's it's a societal construct. That but, we've but, done but but what it represents universe, isn't a constructed but, idea. So when I say there are nine planets, I'm sorry. When I say there are eight planets in our solar system, that even if you wipe out all of humans, maybe like the the word the, the eight leaves, but that concept that there are eight independent things, that like this is something that 
will exist independent of, of human subjectivity. That that's like a that that number is just our way of accounting for some objective fact of the universe. Mm. But, and, I, and I understand you can take issue with that because all of this is running through our personal senses, which may or may not be mm-hmm. able to object. Mm-hmm. Okay, go ahead. Okay, what do you look? Uh, I know I come across like I'm some radical skeptic that is trying to deny everything. I'm not at all. I I use it only to solidify why we have to have an objective morality. That's the only time I will ever consider these sort of radical hypotheses. Like, I'm not someone that's going to say, oh, well, you know, how can you even make any claims about the world? Like, maybe the world doesn't exist. That's fucking stupid, okay? People who do that need to get a life, honestly, because you're getting nothing done by doing that. The only time I ever bring those things into question is when we have to look at why morality is a necessity in life. It's because everything is built off of morality. Um, but the question about numbers, I mean, you're, you're trying to, you're saying a bunch of things really, but you're not really hitting on exactly what a number is. And I'm very familiar, uh, you know, with the realist theories of mathematics, because I'm a mathematical anti-realist. And I think almost every philosopher of mathematics is also an anti-realist about mathematics, because the main proponent, actually I shouldn't say that because they're structuralists, but the main early proponents of uh, mathematical realism were Platonists. And these were people that would you would not agree with the statement that numbers are some mind independent entity that actually exists in another mind independent plane. That was the original theory uh, of mathematics, and it went up to go like Gödel was a mathematical realist. I think you're going to struggle a lot if you try to deny that mathematics is like I agree with you. It's so useful for predicting the things. Uh, predicting the way that the universe works but just because mathematics is useful for predicting that the the world works in a certain way why is that any justification for saying that mathematical entities are real and not just constructions um it's the same thing with science a lot of scientific realists say that the reason why um why scientific entities have to be real is because it's useful in making predictions about the world but there are forms of you know Forms of mathematical okay, I'm going to do something that I would never do if I was capable of having this conversation, and I'm going yeah. to grant you everything that you've just said, okay? I'm going to grant you everything you've just said, which is probably the hardest parts of this conversation, okay? But, so, if I was capable of having this conversation, if I was as versed in this conversation, I would never grant you this, but I'll grant you this now. Or maybe I would because I would understand it, but I'll grant you all of this. Can you argue, take one moral statement, um, murder is wrong. What is yeah. your objective argument for this statement? Um, what do you mean? My, my, like you say that you have an objective, like your, your moral system can exist in an objective manner such that any, I see if every human, so hold on, tell me if this statement is true so I can see I understand. So if, if you're saying that morality is objective within our bubble, okay. And nihilism and bullshit is on the outside, right? If every single human was a perfect logician, should all Mm -hmm. of us be able to agree on a single moral system? Is that true or false? I would say that that is, um, I'd say that is true. Okay, yes. that, Okay. which is what I would, I would agree with that too. Granting you everything I have up to this point, that would be my argument, that every single human should be able to grant a single moral system if morals can exist as an objective truth and if we were all perfectly logical because we'd make the most logical arguments, and right? So my question is, take a statement like murder is wrong and under this system, can you give me your objective, our, our objective argument in favor of, of this moral statement that murdering people is wrong, where we both understand that murder means unprovoked attack for no good reason or whatever, right? Just murdering for joy or whatever, right? Um... Or you can choose a moral statement if you'd like instead, as long as it doesn't have to do with black ravens. I, like, I, I understand sort of what you're trying to do here. You're trying uh-huh. to, you're going to get me to say my moral stance. Okay. And then try to pin me down, well, why that one? Um, yeah, over, I don't need well, yeah, to my, do this. Okay, I, I don't need to do this at all. Because, look, if I say that I'm a utilitarian, you're going to pull out the typical uh, objections against utilitarianism. Uh, you know, utility monster. No, 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 oh, no, no. I'm, I, no, I'm not trying to pin you as being inconsistent. I just want to know what that argument sounds like. I'm just curious what what that argument sounds like. Um, I, I, I am, I am what I would consider uh-huh. some sort of virtue consequentialist. Sure, we've talked about virtue consequentialism. Yes. Sure. 
Yes, and that that would be ultimately my statement. And I would say that murder is wrong, depending on whether or not it produces, you know, the most happiness in the world or whatever. But all that is completely irrelevant to our discussion, which is ultimately about objective morality and whether or not there is one true objective morality. And you also have to remember, cultural relativism is a form of objective morality. I think a lot of people misunderstand, don't understand what objective means. Objective morality means that there is a truth value uh, to moral claims. And that would include something like, um, I, I would even consider error theory, if anyone knows what that is, um, which is Mackey's uh, meta-ethical view, that I would consider that objective morality. The only real form of moral anti-realism uh, is something like, uh, let me see, uh, well, nihilism, essentially, at the end of the day. And emotivism is a form of that. Um, and the reason why that can't be true is because if that is the case, then everything that we do is completely meaningless because we have zero, like, we have absolutely no justification. Why can't, why can't everything we do be completely meaningless? Pardon? Why can't everything we do be completely meaningless? No, I, I'm, I've already told you that nihilism is impossible to be refuted. But when, as soon as you start to say, well, why, well, everything is ultimately meaningless, then I'll just say, well, everything is meaningful. Because as soon as you're a nihilist, you give up everything. You give up the basic tenets of logic. That's it. You shouldn't even be here on this stream talking. Wait, 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 wait. Why? Well, when you say everything is meaningless, I'm sorry. I thought we were only talking insofar as moral statements, right? that all moral judgments are objectively Remember, meaningless. Remember, you, you, you Oh, but you're that arguing you that all of me. science is based on it's this based moral... based on morality, this moral decision that we should choose this logical system. And you did grant me that. God, yeah, well, I... I'm yeah, willing but... to go back and argue through that again. I'm... I... <laughs> It feels like um, I. The problem is that in this conversation, I'm pretty sure that you can argue both sides of it better than I can. So I, I, I don't know. I don't. I don't think my argument is that unintuitive uh, or, or that like really complicated. Because at the basis of everything, why do we choose our set of logical laws? Sure. Like the the problem that I have is that like, and I don't even know if this is really directly related. Is that mm -hmm. for any concept that I consider somewhat difficult or somewhat convoluted, that for any of these concepts, if I needed to argue this with a person, if I needed to argue some form of thought with a person, I could choose an example, a very easy, relatable example. I could choose one, and I could demonstrate this is why my line of thinking is superior to your line of thinking. And I could do this with any difficult topic. Um, say for religion, right? Somebody says, I'm religious, okay? You're not religious. You know, why is your line of thinking better? I would say that same argument that I was studying earlier with you. Well, my line of thinking makes better predictions. And then I would go through different religious thoughts that lead us down bad paths. For instance, um, some religious people say you should teach abstinence-only education. Well, here's a bunch of empirical data on why abstinence-only education is bad, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That I, would, I, I could go down this road, or people that don't believe in um, allowing blood transfusions and end up having their kids die. This is the way that I would go. But when I try to approach your system, and my argument, this argument that I'm making right now is somewhat fallacious, because just because your idea is difficult to understand or complex doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong. Wrong. That's a, that, that would be a fallacious argument to make. But the fact that your all of your arguments are so incredibly esoteric makes it really hard for like you said that you didn't feel like your arguments were that unintuitive. They feel really unintuitive to me because all of the arguments are so esoteric. So like anything that defines like all of science as being built on moral subjectivity is really hard. But, I guess like we would have to spend like a, a long time like going through the the how, how you build that up. No, no, look, let, mm -hmm. I can put this as basic as you can. Okay. Look, <laughs> yeah. There's, we, everyone agrees, P and not P is false. Something can't be both black and not black. Sure. My question to people who are nihilists are to say, or sorry, to people who are moral anti-realists, who deny that morality has a truth value, who say that, uh, to say that a moral claim can be neither true or false, they are moral nihilists, is, well, why do you even accept the basic tenets of, of uh, symbolic logic? The reason is you can't without a form of morality. As soon as you appeal to anything about how accurate it is about the world, that is a subjective decision that you've made that appeals to some form of morality. It is useful. It is okay, wait, wait, okay, okay, hold on. Just, I'm just gonna go through these like one at a time. Thanks, so, buddy. okay, fuck. I feel like we're gonna retread all ground, dude, because uh, no, I, no, I no, just no, can't I follow this. So, because so, I think I said this earlier, and now you're gonna re-repeat what you said. 
that no, statement, no, that a moral statement, is equivalent mm-hmm. to an observational statement. This, these are two statements that I don't consider to be equivocal. Why wait, are wait, equivocal? Sorry. Can you go back? So, the that. ball is blue and murder is wrong. These are two yeah. statements that I consider to be different claims. And then you said, different well, claims. both of them, like different types of claims, uh, like a normative versus a descriptive claim, that normative yes, and descriptive are. claims are inherently separate, that normative claims do not exist naturally in the universe. That, that, that's yeah. what I would say. No normative claim exists naturally. Um, it, only, only descriptive claims do. That normative claims are entirely human constructed and can vary okay. from person to person. Right. So look, let, let's just let's lay this out here. So you're saying, let me grab my piece of paper. We have these two statements. What was it? This this is a blue ball. Is that what this ball? Sure. Blue? Or any descriptive statement is something this that ball it, is blue. Yeah. Okay. That I would argue so that these are statements that if all humans died tomorrow, these statements are still true, and these statements still have value. But every single normative claim is the opposite, that once all of humanity disappears, every normative claim is now defunct. It doesn't exist anymore and are all meaningless. Okay, do you see how you've already gone up a rung on the ladder here? You've already, you actually have to look at why you're justifying those very claims. And that's where you find my position, that in order to justify those very claims, you have to appeal to some form of normativity or morality. Okay. You have to do that. So and look, how? you're trying to say that this ball is blue, is uh, of a different type. I agree with you on that point. I agree they're completely different type of statements uh, than murder is wrong. Okay. How do you justify that? Justify what? Justify the statement that this ball is blue is different than murder is wrong. So ball is blue. So ball is a specific description of a physical object that we believe will exist in the universe independent of all humans existing. That a ball okay, or a right. stone, right? Okay, go ahead. It's logical structure is different, right? Um, you know, this ball is blue saying that there is an object in front of me such called X such okay. that X is blue, okay? okay. And exhibits some Murder property. is wrong. Okay, yeah. Yeah, murder is wrong uses a completely different form of logic. It uses what we call deontic logic or if you're a consequentialist, maybe you can use modal logic or something, but you can't express it in what we call predicate logic. And I'm realizing now that I'm probably sounding very esoteric. Um, well, so, no, this is, you saying this is better because earlier when I brought this up, you said that both of those things were the same and they both sounded like truth claims. So no, no, no. If these are different forms of logic, I took then, issue. Okay. I took issue with you saying that there was different notions of truth depending on the type of claim. Because that doesn't quite make sense to me. Okay. Um, Get, bear with me, okay? Because I don't know all the I don't know all the absolutely. terms. Sorry, but go ahead. Okay. I, I know I, I know I sometimes come across like I'm like being demanding or and I, I hate coming across like that. It it just my type of speaking. I'm very to the point and blunt. But yeah, I no, I'm just saying that um, I, I, I'm um, just saying that um, when I make statements, keep in mind that I don't have the of course, formal of course, background, yes. so I might yeah, say something definitely. that sounds okay, like to a layman, but it's not true. So just be aware right. of that, right? So when I say like these, like these two statements don't sound true in the same way, I might be using that word "true" incorrectly, and maybe what I should have said, or well, I didn't know I should have said, but maybe I should have said is they're using different forms of logic to arrive at their truth claim. Is what I should have said, I guess. Right. Okay. okay. So that that is a very different claim than saying that there's different forms of truth because okay. all different forms of logic, symbolic logic, geontic logic, the paraconsistent fuzzy logic, whatever, they all have a truth value, and okay. that 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 quantity, that truth maker, is ultimately the same in all forms of okay. logic. Okay. So can we fo- can we reconcile the differences in these statements, and you can tell me why they're not why they're not different, or are, do you do you do agree they're different, or? Well, there are different types of statements, but the ultimate value of both of them is it's truth. The referent of both of these statements is a value of true or false. Okay, but, I mean, but, 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 any, but if the truth is relative to a different thing, then the, the, the value of that truth is different, I guess. Okay, um, so this ball is blue has a different type of truth than uh, this ball is red? Yeah, but I don't know if I'm using the right words. How do you justify... I understand what you're going at here. You're saying that because they're of a different logical form, they must have some different notion of truth to them. Uh But how do you justify that statement? I'm not sure you really can. You know? Like, I understand exactly what you're saying, that because they are formed through different logical systems, they don't usually signify the same thing. One is descriptive, one is normative. They must have some different notion of truth, and that they, they aren't really signifying the same notion of truth. But ultimately, I would ask you how to justify that. And I don't think you can. And you might say, oh, well, I need to think about it more. But I think you could think about that all you like. I've literally, 
I don't know any position that really advocates that view. I guess well, like, the, well, like we have to, the, if we can't reconcile this, then we're always going to be talking past each other. I, I don't know what words I need to use to illustrate my thoughts. Um, I don't like, know. I don't think we will be talking past each other. Because, <laughs> but I really do because I can't accept that. So like, if the, if, if we, if, if we could, but see, like, I'm not even sure if my logic, I might even be begging the question here. If we define our observer as a rock, a rock can observe that a ball is blue, but a rock wouldn't be able to observe that murder is wrong. That that these are the the types of logic used to arrive at these conclusions are not applicable to all observers. I guess. Does, well, a rock a rock can't observe anything. It's a rock. <laughs> okay. I'm, I, <laughs> yeah, we ha- we have to reconcile this before we move past. I, I can't, or, or make me realize why I'm wrong. I guess, like, because. Forget about, as soon as you're talking about the world itself, I think you've already presupposed something. And we're, we're again, we're trying to start from the very uh, foundation. And I know people are asking questions in chat. And mm-hmm. if you have questions or people are trying to refute me, I'm more than willing to do that. Um, people keep bringing up Godel's theorem. Yeah. How, how is that at all? Um, Godel's theorem has absolutely nothing to do with this. Godel's theorem, Godel's theorem comes after... Um, the very foundations of logic, and it's it's not at all has nothing to do with logic because people talking about Godel's theorem for whatever reason. Um, uh, I, I can't I can't. This is what I can't personally accept, uh, accept right now. Maybe I'm religious. Maybe this is a matter of faith. I can't accept that the statement that murder is wrong is the same type of statement as like the, it the rock is blue or the ball is it, blue. It is not statement, but it does. It, I'm sorry, it's not the same type of statement, but it doesn't matter. Saying that they're descriptive and normative claims. They're okay. completely different. I, I totally understand uh, where you're getting at with this. But ultimately, it doesn't matter. Because if you dissect the logical structure of both of these statements, you're going to find that the truth value is the exact same. Okay, how about, okay, how about we test this like this? And you can tell me if, I, if we're going anywhere here, okay? If an sure. alien comes to our planet, every single yeah. descriptive statement that I make, I should be able to translate to the alien in some way such that they not only understand with this, understand the statement, but they agree with it on some level, okay? Mm-hmm. Would you agree with that or disagree with that for descriptive statements? Uh, I would agree. Okay, so, but with normative statements, it is entirely possible that I could never, ever, ever get him to agree in, in the truth value of any normative statement. That maybe no. they could understand, but they would never agree that it's like a truthful statement. How can you... Do, would um, you agree or disagree with that? I would disagree. If they are using some form of logical system that we have, if they want to move past, if they ultimately want to move past... Um, complete nihilism they're going to have to agree on some appeal to mag or to pragmatism or they're not going to even be at any sort of level that we're at right now because if you're not appealing to pragmatism i don't know what you're doing to be quite frank uh you're yeah i don't know what you would do i i don't okay see here's a meme do you ever read ender's game <laughs> I have read it. Okay, here's a meme, okay? Buggers come to our planet and start killing individual humans. One of the big fuck-ups that they had in that book is they thought that humans were like ants, right? That there's a central hive processing mind and that, right? Yes. But obviously, that was, like, morally wrong to us. How do you argue that to them if, that if say, that's the way that they just view things, that people are just hives and really the only part that matters is, like, the central important thing? As long as they can reproduce, it's irrelevant. Destiny, you're you're, you're pulling the Azot gap here. (laughs) I thought that... I'm, I can't. can't. I'm lost. Do I don't think I'm equipped to deal with this. What do you mean? Wait, how is this the Azad gap now? You're saying that because of the way that these buggers view the world, that you're trying to say that because of the way that. Can you restate what you said? I just want to. How can I tell a bugger that my normative claim, murder, is wrong? How do I tell him that's true? That's true. Well, first, it's- you make sure that you're talking the same language. Uh, yeah, okay, obviously, yeah, yeah, moving past all of that. We can communicate with one another, obviously. How do I tell him that okay. murdering an individual human is wrong? That normative claim is a true claim. How can I tell him that? Because he could disagree. The same and say, way well, that I'm, I'm telling you. The well, same but, okay, but then he says that, okay, let's say that I argue that a, a ball is blue. And the bugger mm. says, I disagree, okay? And then I say, mm. okay, well, let's go through our statements, okay? A ball is something that is defined, defined as a spherical object, the arrangement of matter in such a form that it forms a sphere. Okay, I imagine I could get him to agree with that. And then I say mm. blue corresponds to this wavelength on the electromagnetic spectrum, and it um, absorbs all wavelengths except for this that it reflects, so it has the appearance of being blue, and I could get him to agree with that. And then is is our connecting verb, and I hope that somehow we can agree on basic formal logic. And then I could go, look, the ball is blue. I have proven it. You must accept 
accept this? And you'll go, okay, I am perfectly logical. I accept it, right? Now I want to say murder is wrong. And you'll go, okay, well, define that for me. So murder is the act of, of taking another person's life. Can causing... I be the bugger? Can I pretend to be the bugger? Sure. No, I would have to be the bugger because you're just going to agree with me. <laughs> And kill my argument. No, I'll, I'll be the bugger. Well, here, let me let me let me just let me, let me finish where I, where I feel like it, it it comes off. Okay, so I say murder is wrong. Okay, murder is the description of a physical act of depriving somebody of brain function. Okay, w- which yeah. I can get him to agree with. Then I say wrong. Now, mm-hmm. how do I define wrong? How do you? What is your definition of wrong there, such that you can get him to agree that your normative statement is true? Well, it depends first on. Like, I, I'm not saying that we've reached a point in humanity right now where we all agree. No, but I'm saying we notion. do. We all, we all do because we believe in your bubble. We live in that world where we're all perfect logicians and we all have the same moral system and we all believe that murder is wrong for your perfectly logical reason. But now an alien is asking you to justify that truth claim the same way that you did the ball is blue. How do you tell him? How do you define wrong in this equation, in this logic statement? Assuming that they've not gone completely bonkers and mm-hmm. have indeed appealed to pragmatism, they say, oh, well, of course, because based on our very foundational axiom that we've built everything off of, clearly that normative statement is right. Now, look, look, you're, you're, you're appealing to the way that the world is. You're saying, look, these buggers are here. This is, what, this is what you said. Hey, buggers, look, I can look at the wavelength of the world. I could show you that this is blue. So you're going to agree that, you know, that this ball is blue. What happens if this bugger comes up to you and says, what the fuck are you talking about? I don't subscribe to your laws of, of science. We don't even conduct science. We're not concerned at all with the way that the world is. We do everything so that we can watch as much Seinfeld as we possibly can. That's, the, that's all we do. And so all of our descriptive theories are for that sole purpose. I don't care about this accuracy thing that you're going after. Who cares about the way that the world is? We just want to watch Seinfeld. Right. Their cognitive end might not be the same. And so ultimately, it's this normative claim that they'll agree on even before any sort of descriptive claim, because if they're appealing, if they're at all appealing to pragmatism, they must have already they must already have some normative foundation that they're operating under. Right. What and what if they just think that. um, What if. They just take over and kill everybody. And that's how they function. Well, I mean, what, what, what's stopping people from killing everybody right now? Like, who Not objective morality, they're... that's for sure. No? Well, no. That's, again, <laughs> we're, we're talking about the status of normative claims. The way that people operate have absolutely no bearing on uh, exactly what is right and what is wrong. Like you said, you, you've tried to say that if everyone dies, then normative statements lose their truth value. Or actually, you've said that they don't have a truth value to begin with, but ultimately they're going to be meaningless in all sense of the word as soon as all of humanity dies. And I would say that's absolutely not true because as soon as some other... Well, actually, I would say that... No, I think you could even argue that um, descriptive claims in that same sense, as soon as humanity all die, then any sort of descriptive claim loses its value because there's nothing really to observe and process the world in the same way that we have. And so, again, like I've said, language or logic is really just a reflection of our natural language. It's not something that we I don't, discuss. Uh, I don't seven. think I agree with that statement either. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that logic is reflective of our natural language. Like, I feel like, but, but if everybody agrees, I just don't understand it. I just can't understand it. Like, when we say, like, eight, the number eight, that, represent, that concept is real, independent of human existence. That, that the number eight isn't modeled after humans. It's like it's not re- reflective of our language, but but rather it's like a, a way that we describe like a, objective reality that exists independently of us. Hopefully, assuming that we observe reality in an objective manner. But what if I, what if the the buggers come to you and say objective reality? We don't care about that. I don't know what objective reality is. Our We've decided that we're living in a constant state of nihilism. Everything that you're talking about here is completely meaningless. I don't recognize that there's some objective world. I, I believe that, you know, really it's just myself and everything outside of me I is feel completely like, skeptical. Because I'm not making that normative step to pragmatism. And this person would be that. capable of achieving technology sufficient to travel to other planets? Hello, you're... you're you're a nihilist right now and you're sitting on a computer playing terraria and talking to me over this microphone okay wait what does that have to do with anything because even though humanity have not all had any sort of 
objective morality for almost their entire existence doesn't mean that technical uh, technological evolution has not occurred. Okay, well, let's say the person that steps off their ship is like a, blood, a logical scientist, moralist, philosopher. <laughs> I, t- okay. I, I don't know. Um, look, ultimately, the root of my entire argument um, also just uh, the root of my entire argument is that to make any sort of step towards making claims about the way that the world works, mm-hmm. making claims about mathematics, making claims about logic, you have to take a first normative step. You have to make a moral claim about why. Why should I even follow your form of logic? Yeah, but you can make that. But but then my argument is that you can make that normative claim and recognize that it's arbitrary. What was your response to that? If you're acknowledging that it's arbitrary, well, it depends on really what you mean by arbitrary. By arbitrary, do you mean that ultimately it's not 100% in your notion of objective, right? Correct. If so, I completely agree with that. Of course. It, it would make no sense not to. That's why I came up with the bugger example that I don't subscribe to your theory about the way that the world is because my end, my moral judgment is that we should do everything so that we can watch Seinfeld. Right? They're arbitrary. I completely agree with that. But look, if you are making any sort of statement within this little bubble that we've created that's already appealed to pragmatism, you have to acknowledge that as soon as you start to talk about or well, ultimately, why does it even matter if it's arbitrary? Because can you come up with any scenario uh, where the fact that it's arbitrary has any bearing on anything whatsoever? Sure, when you try to argue it to another person, if you don't acknowledge its arbitrariness, then... Well, if they're arguing, if they're arguing for a completely different notion of this initial normative step, then they have to acknowledge... If they're arguing for anything other than pragmatism, then they have a completely different worldview than you. 100%. It is my fundamental belief that every philosopher, every human being alive, whether or not they want to admit it or not, is not a nihilist. They might say that they're a nihilist right now, but the, every single day of their life, they're going out, they're buying bread. They're not constantly calling into question about the status of whether the world exists or not. It only becomes, and this is using David Lewis's terminology, it only becomes epistemically relevant um, when we start to consider these uh, really skeptical hypotheses. We're operating under this axiomatic system. That Can't you be like a hedonistic on. nihilist person, or is that just totally impossible? No, if you well, no, it, a, a nihilist denies the, any normative claims at all. So that's what I like to do on my on my server. Uh, people will come in and they'll start arguing. I mean. I hate politics. I really hate politics because I I honestly, I think politics is one of the stupidest things in the world right now because we should be focusing much more on the base ethics of everything. Because if you don't have an agreed upon ethical base, you're getting nowhere. You're talking past each other over and over again. And that's it. Same with economics. I feel like I sort of just dissed you in some sort of fashion. No, I 150 trillion percent agree with that statement. Okay. That having a conversation, for instance, on minimum wage is fucking retarded when we don't even know what is the responsibility of a business or a government. Um, Yes. That's, oh, fuck. Have you ever heard of a website called, like, Star Codex something? No, I have not. Okay, never mind. I read some big article on that that had to do with that, that, um, that... Oh, that a lot of these questions are impossible to answer, and that, that there's a reason like that. That most political discussion is absurd because you you're you're starting a philosophical basis or can be so radically different than it's you're not even having a real discussion. Sure. Yeah, and I I think ultimately you just have to. You know, oh, Slate Star Codex is the name of the site. Yeah, sorry. Okay, go ahead. Um, but originally I wanted to go into um, into politics, and I just realized that. Like, I would consider myself a socialist. Like, that's just sort of who I am. I'm not going to try to justify that to anyone who discusses politics Mm -hmm. because I recognize that they don't they don't really talk about the morality of it. And it sounds almost egotistical to say, but they don't understand the very fundamental of it. They don't understand what it means uh, to make any sort of normative statement. Oh, or wait, or abortion is wrong or abortion is right. I don't, I don't see any value in talking to people uh, who say things like that unless they have some understanding of 
the core ethical values. Sure, I agree. And that's why I, that's why I don't watch political. Um, that's why I don't watch people discuss politics because I most of the time they don't really understand what they're, they're really talking just, about. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think to an extent, you do it a lot better. You you actually have these sorts of discussions. I think you should have them more often, <laughs> but uh, they take a lot of effort. It, you know, you have to devote. Sure, but at the end of the day, even you can understand we have to appeal to pragmatism to some extent because we can't just neglect all of politics until we figure out our ethics because then oh, everybody would probably absolutely. starve and die. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I, I absolutely agree with that. But if, if we are going to go down a path of, well, trying to figure out the way that the world works, the way that the world is, um, and as soon as we start talking about normativity, we really do have to start looking at ethics. And mm-hmm. I don't think we're going to progress. Uh, at least in a very, uh, I guess, a good way, unless we start looking at the ethics of everything. Sure. And because, a lot of people, yeah. a lot of people will object to me and say, "Okay, look, I agree with you on." Actually, no. Going back to what I said about on my server and discussing politics with people is that they'll say that they're a nihilist, like you have, and they'll say that you know normative claims don't have a truth value, and so I have this little notebook here. And I have their name on it. Uh-oh. And I look at them in my chat. And every time they make a normative claim and they've said that they're a nihilist, I say, what do you mean by that? Because they can't justify it. They're making oh, okay. a I, I thought, no, I could be wrong. And maybe your people feel this way too, but I, I'm not sure I could be wrong. But I just, I feel like I can simultaneously be a nihilist and then recognize the absurdity of the universe and the lack of meaning, but then still go on to say that because of, like, whatever, like, I can have my own personal subjective experiences and and do what I think is best for being happy or whatever. Is is that not possible? Are these contradictory statements? Like, some form of, like, existential nihilism or something? Or is this not possible? You're... I understand what you're saying. I I, I think that's absolutely contradictory. You're... You're at, at okay, so like here, here are some statements that I make. So I would say, okay, the universe has no objective, no objective meaning. So if somebody murders me, this is not an objectively bad action. That I, the universe makes no objective judgment on any of these actions. Okay, and I recognize that I can live, I can die, and objectively, none of these things have any intrinsic meaning. Now, for my own personal happiness, which for whatever reason, because I exist as an organism that has personal happiness, there are things that I prefer to do that make me happy. Now, I recognize that insofar as the universe goes, there is no objective reason for me to um, pursue this happiness or or to compel anyone else to do it but i think i can do it by uh, making emotional appeals and all of that that i so i can still believe that everything is um like by definition objectively meaningless that the universe makes no judgments on morality but i can have my own personal moral system built out of a kind of a hedonistic view that i want to do things that make me happy and make me feel good and then i can convince other people similarly are, are these at some point did i did i leave nihilism there did i like leave it and i'm just not yeah. even aware of it or okay well at what point? Yeah. Well, it's, you know, it is people that ultimately, those are the types of people that I interact with daily. Okay. Um, and it, it is people that will claim that they're nihilists in these very fringe instances when it works best to their, when it, um, when in a certain situation it works best for them. But as soon as they're starting to be pressed on it, uh, or sorry, where they're not being pressed on, you know, the status of their moral claims. They're just saying normative claims out out their rear end. It's almost like a... Okay, wait, wait. So can you give me an example of this? P- press me on something that you think I can't possibly justify. Okay. Um, let me think. Um, wait, not, think and not something rela- nothing related to Einstein, nothing related to quantum mechanics. <laughs> no, no, okay. you're... You're talking about like a, a moral claim. Yeah, right? like what's a moral claim that I would make on on abortion or education or immigration or something? What is a moral claim that I would make? And then as I'm making this, you'd go, ah, since you made that moral claim, you can't possibly be a nihilist, all right? Well, as soon as you make any sort of moral claim, you can't be a nihilist. The nihilist denies the truth value of any. Um, so either you acknowledge that when you're saying that people are wrong in politics, mm-hmm. like as soon as you come on here. As soon as someone like me comes on here and starts debating you on fucking abortion or whatever, and then you say, no, you're wrong on that because of blank, I could immediately call you out and say, well, what do you mean they're wrong? You you must acknowledge that what you just said means nothing because you've acknowledged sure, that. Sure. So when blank. I say wrong, I my, my, qual- my unspoken qualifier, when I say wrong, I am assuming that both of us share this axiom that we want to live and be happy, that, that both of us share that. But, but that, 
Okay, that is it. a normative claim. Yeah, that sure. Is a normative claim. But I can't. I can't simultaneously recognize that that is a um, that that is a subjective uh, that that axiom is unjustified and any other axiom is equally valid in insofar as the universe is concerned. That I've left nihilism by saying that, or I could have a totally incorrect understanding of what nihilism. That's what I'm getting at. Maybe I just don't know. This is why I try not to label myself because I'm always wrong, or, and because I don't have a well enough understanding. But like, can can if I were to make these statements, okay? So tell me, just in these simple statements, if I have escaped nihilism, okay? If I'm if we're not nihilist anymore, okay? I think that the universe and everything in the universe that there is no intrinsic meaning in anything, and by meaning I mean nothing is good or bad or good or evil. That these are words that mean nothing, absolutely nothing. That a man driving a knife. Or their emotions. Sure, a, dr- a man. Well, emotions exist in a very materialistic physical sense i believe due to neurochemical reactions so i wouldn't say they are emotions because emotions no, but, emotions like, are real but good and evil are not real things no, no, in a materialistic no, 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 but, sense but an emotivist like aj Iyer would say that when i say oh murder is bad it's really the same as going right They're the same oh thing. sure that it is a biological entity that is trying to make a statement that justifies its own existence or, yes. or would further continue its own existence yeah that, that that that's how i would identify all moral statements um if, if you want to yeah. say they exist then they only exist in that way a moral statement only exists such that a biological a biological organism is positing a statement that probably ultimately serves to further its own interest or whatever right that's the only type of moral statement that i recognize but objective moral truth does not exist in the universe so am, am i no longer now a nihilist because because I believe that, or is it still nihilism? Or if if you are making any sort of normative statement and trying to justify that, uh, and well, no, look what I've said. Well, here so wait, so what are, what are what are we at this point? What can I call myself? People in chat are saying absurdist. I don't know what the fuck that means at all. Like absurdist, like fucking Camus. Yeah, cause somebody said Camus earlier, so I don't know. Albert Camus. Um, Oh, see, I, w- I thought it was Camus the longest time. And I said it in class one day, and I was so embarrassed. Yikes. Um, look, that's a continental. Um, he's a continentalist. I-, I think I read Myth of Sisyphus. And um, what's the other one? Stranger? Uh, yeah, Stranger. No, but, no Resistance, uh, Rebellion, and Death was the other one that I read. Um, and I I honestly, I'm not a, I don't know a whole lot about... Uh, continentalism and Camus was a continentalist uh, but I think absurdism is uh, okay but we're not we're not a nihilist then well but assur- absurdism is ultimately you can uh, I think it's almost the same as nihilism at the end of the day um, okay so then I am so what part did I say then that you don't agree because as soon as this is my argument as soon as you make a claim like I'm a nihilist okay. or one plus one equals two. You've presupposed. You've presupposed uh, some sort of normative claim. And if you are a true nihilist, you have to acknowledge that the person who says one plus one equals two and the person that says one plus one equals three are just as actually justified as each other. One is not more correct than the other. One is more correct because of their subjective decision to represent accuracy. Well, the other is more correct because they've chosen that, you know, they want to watch Seinfeld for their entire life. And that's why they've chosen to accept their law of accidents. You have to actually acknowledge that. And I don't think you do want to acknowledge that because, like... Yeah, I don't think so. Right, exactly. Wait, so, so what, to- did we ever give an example of, like, um... What did I ask earlier? For some type of moral... Or, you no, know, you said it didn't matter because anytime I make any normative claim... Okay, so then... So then if, a, if somebody says, okay, I am a nihilist, I recognize mm-hmm. nothing matters, I'll, however, I don't want you to murder me because I want to live, now I'm no longer a nihilist? Well, this all comes down to intention and what we really mean by language. And <laughs> I think that's... <laughs> no, wait, what? How? Why? Wait, well, so you're not, like, you can't well, answer so that so question? Well, no, this, th- you're asking me basically to go into your head and really look at the psychological... Well, I know I'm asking you to assume these both of these statements are true, okay? And I'm not oh. lying to you or something. So if I say as a human, okay. okay, I say I recognize nothing has objective meaning, nothing has objective value, there is no good or evil, but I don't want you to murder me because I don't want to be murdered. Am I no longer a nihilist at that point? No, you're still a nihilist. You're saying you're describing a psychological reaction to an instance. Okay. But you Wait. didn't say if you had said you shouldn't murder me, then you're no longer a nihilist. Okay, so when I say... I don't want to be murdered, okay? Mm-hmm. And then I do things to keep you from murdering me. Mm-hmm. Does, am I still a nihilist? 
Sure, you can be a nihil. Those are descriptive claims. Okay, okay, okay. Hold on, hold on. Ooh, here it comes. Okay, if <laughs> the thing that I do to convince you not to murder me is to tell you that if you don't murder me, I won't murder you, am I still a nihilist? Or did we jump somewhere into normative claims? Wait, wait, can you repeat that? Okay, I don't want to be murdered, okay? Someone is coming to murder me. I don't want to be murdered. Yeah. I recognize yeah. there's no objective truth. We're still nihilist, still nihilist, okay? I don't want to mm -hmm. be murdered. Guy comes over here, and he's about to murder me. And I go, whoa, listen up. If you, I could murder you, actually, okay? If you don't murder me, I won't murder you, okay? Are we still a nihilist at this point or no? Yes. We are still a nihilist. Okay, yes, yes. It, okay, so this is- chat saying- No, no, ignore, ignore, ignore chat. Fuck chat, oh, okay, okay, ignore chat, okay? okay. So this is how I build my entire- <laughs> I chat, yes. So, because you keep telling me that I'm not a nihilist, and I'm not trying to like hold on to nihilism. If I'm not, I'm not, or it's whatever, I don't care. But like, so this is how I build my entire moral system. So what, what I say is reciprocated values. I don't know, some people say social contract. I don't know, there might be better ways. But this is how I build my moral system, is I say whatever I would demand for myself, um, I, I will demand for another, and because I want them to, to, to want the same as I, I would hope that they would do the same. So for instance, the reason why I don't break into my neighbor's house and murder him and rape his wife is because I don't want somebody else to break into my house and murder me and rape my wife. And I assume that nobody wants that. So if all of us can share that, that, that similar hedonistic belief that we don't want our shit taken and that we don't want people to rape our family members, right? If, if I assume we all share that, and as humans we tend to because it's biological entities, that's how mm -hmm. we're wired, right? That I can, I can demand they reciprocate these values because it's in their you best interest. You can't demand anything. Okay, when I when I say demand, I can make a convincing argument such that they should have no choice but to accept it. Because no, they you said should. That's okay. a normative claim. When I say should, I mean that they will accept it because it's in their look, best interest to. Look, Desi, let, let us even suppose that everyone is a complete hedonist and everything. Okay. everyone does everything to be happy. How do you bridge the Azop gap? You can't. Okay, no, 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 no. So... We have, let's say that we have um, a neighborhood, okay? Let's say that yeah. there are four people that live in this neighborhood, okay? Okay. Now, all four of these people, okay, mm -hmm. live in such a way that they all have AR-15s, a.k.a. the child-killing assault weapons, okay? All yes. of them have AR-15s and they're ready to kill each other, okay? Now, if any person goes out and steals everybody's shit, okay? They could kill the other people in their sleep, okay? They could very easily yeah. do it. One guy could go out and kill one person in their sleep, okay? Anybody could do it, okay? Now, what these people say is, hey, I don't want to be killed, and I don't want my shit taken, so what if we all come to a mutual agreement that all of us say, hey, listen, we don't, none of us want our shit taken, so none of us should take each other's shit, because it's all in our best interest to do so. Is this now no longer nihilism, or... No, th that is called rational egoism, and okay. that's why people are yelling egoism. Is rational? E I've also heard. I think um, that is an objective. Mor that's a that's a claim about objective morality. That that sorry, that is an objective moral claim. That how is, that that is not nihilist because you're saying what you should do is in your best interest. Or as someone has said here, it's a social contract, and social contract theory is still a normative claim. Okay, then I guess I'm Actually, a rational you, you egoist. Yeah, but God, fuck you if you're a rational egoist. God, it's not 1925, Destiny. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, ultimately, the issue with egoism is, one, is ought gap, and two, it's self-defeating. Um, okay, how is it self-defeating? Because, look, if you're, if you're uh, an egoist, it mm -hmm. comes into issues. Uh, egoism comes into issues about how you want to define egoism. Because if you're an egoist, it is actually in your best interest to help other people. So you're actually sort of going against the tenet of egoism. And That's yes, okay, though. Why isn't that okay? Why is that not valid? Because the egoist says you should only do what will help yourself. Yeah, and but so if yes, what it helps yourself is ultimately helping other people. But helping other people. Right. Um, and so it's sort of almost self-defeating. And so what's the point in going Why for Why would you say self-defeating, but I say like circular, like positive <sighs> feedback? What, what's the, how do you argue yours? And what do you mean positive feedback? Okay, let's say that there is a room full of women and all of them want to fuck me, okay? But also, all of them are starving to death. So, if I go into that room and I feed all of them, they will have the necessary sustenance to come to the next room and fuck me, okay? I'm doing this in an egotistical manner, but then would you argue, huh, well, you're not being egotistical. Even though you're ultimately doing it to be self-serving, you're actually helping other people, so you're not an egoist at all. Would you make that claim or no? Um, no, I, I, I think there's a... 
there's a very common misconception people have about egoism. It's that there's sort of two forms of uh, egoism. Uh, one is, uh, what's it called? Um, psychological egoiz- egoism. And the other is ethical egoism. And the issue is to ultimately, I'm, I'm sorry, I feel like I'm avoiding your question here. Yeah, um, me too. No, no, sorry. <laughs> At least I recognize it. I don't think most of your guests actually recognize it. I did not do it consciously. Um, sorry, why is it self-defeating? It's self-defeating because at the end of the day, if you're having a, an ethical theory centered around what is best, uh, uh, you should be doing what is best for you, why can you not just argue that some other ethical theory basically does that for you? Because I think uh, this one is, because I would argue that this one is the best one. And then right. I would ask you, give me a competing theory that can do better. Okay, I, I, I think I can sort of see where you're going with this. And I do think that the self-defeating claim is actually not as good as the obvious naturalistic fallacy. Okay, what is a naturalistic fallacy? How does it, How is this naturalistic at all? Well, can you? how can you justify um, doing what is good for you is what we should do? Uh, it, that's like a, I don't know, if I, am I allowed to use the expression hedonistic claim? Like, it's just a biological impulse I have. Right, so you're going from psychological egoism... Oh, equal. so this is, uh, it's my Keep axiom. Going. It's my axiom. <laughs> the Ezra no, gap yeah, is my can't. axiom there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, like it kind of is like, so I would argue that I want to do things that I think, I think that this is permissible because isn't this like a core tenet of almost all philosophers? So like, don't almost all philosophers say that suffering should be reduced? Is it, And you would never no. say like. No, really? Isn't that like a pretty broad claim that most philosophers agree that we should like no. reduce suffering, that that's like a thing that should be avoided if possible? No, absolutely not. I mean, like deontologists don't give a fuck about consequences. Okay, well, in that case, then it's just a fuck, then it's it's literally like a, like a, like, I don't want to be killed, therefore, um, no one should kill me. I, well, I mean, like, if how can you bridge that? What's the simplest way to do that? You, you don't, because ethical egoism is dumb. That's, that's how you bridge it. But... Um, like well, they're not, okay, but how how does it happen? Is it just then it's just an unjustified claim, right? I mean, we're we're delving into normative ethics here, which is sure. a very but, but, complex. But like, issue. I feel like my I feel like my counter then is going to be that I would argue that my claim here is maybe unjustified, which, which is why it's axiomatic. Um, but if it's unjustified, whatever definition you're going to give me to justify your claim, I'm going to argue is just as arbitrary, right? Isn't technically every is ought claim an arbitrary claim? Like there is no definitive is ought gap closer, right? Unless you're Sam Harris. No, but who's who's? I'm not making an is ought claim. No, no, but well, I mean, I am, but I'm just saying it's an unjustified claim that I just pre- presuppose. I guess it's just true because it has to be. But that doesn't isn't that kind of a sort of like rooted in my 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 not nihilism that right the idea that I don't think that any sort of is ought claim can ever be justified because it's literally impossible to do so because there is no objective morality isn't that doesn't that kind of tie everything together? Um, I, so can you repeat that? Sorry, that <laughs> so I, I think I would in. argue. So I think that my root belief is that it is impossible to bridge an is-ought gap. That that can never possibly be bridged because okay, is, is, a descri- yeah. is a descriptive claim and an ought is a normative claim and that normative claims don't exist in the materialistic world and you can't possibly get a normative claim from, from an is. You can never get an ought from an is. It's not possible because, it's, because it doesn't exist. Okay, I just I want to establish right now that yeah. we're not talking about the initial issue, which is about status of objective morality here this is completely no relevant. i understand but i'm just okay. saying that when somebody so i would say that i exist and i want this to is live a discussion, okay really. sure but okay. but i exist and i want to exist and i want to continue existing um but that's just that's totally unjustified um but that but i'm okay with that it's just that's just my unjustified claim right yeah i i don't see yeah i guess you would um I guess you're a nihilist, I guess, but it just means that whenever you're saying you that said I wasn't should... though, were you lying? So I actually I, did. No. I won. I'm a nihilist now. No, because you did say that you should. You said that the reason why these people, you know, shouldn't do anything to each other is because that if they do something to me, then I might do something to them, or someone else would do something to them. Okay. That ethical egoist tenet, and that is still a normative claim. Oh, okay. Well, then I'm not a nihilist because I'm the ethical egoist dude, right? Right. Yeah. Sure. Wait. So I'm not nihilist. No, you're not a nihilist. If okay. you're saying that people shouldn't hurt other people because it could cause harm to yourself, you're an ethical egoist. Okay, gotcha. But again, that's just wrong. Well, wait, why is it wrong again? Because of his odd. Wait, but what is odd is what is odd works. 
Aesop does not work. Well, doesn't he, every wait? Doesn't every single philosophy have like a, a should statement? Like you should do something? Isn't that by definition an Aesop or not? Yeah. Oh no no no. That's uh yes. Okay. I I understand now okay. why you have. Okay. No, that's not right at all. Because I'm dumb. Okay. Yeah. Make me. No, undumb. it's not because you're dumb. It's like for example, um, Kant's critique of pure reason and critique of pure judgment. His entire theory does not have an issue with the Aesop gap. It's everything is completely analytic. One is completely uh, a priori. Wait, so why would Kant say murder is wrong? Because from the pure reason itself, it is wrong. It violates the categor. Ugh. It violates the categorical imperative. It has nothing to do with the way that the world. Wait, is. why is the categorical imperative something that should be followed or respected? Why? Ugh, I mean, have you seen the thickness of critique? Like, I can give you sort no. of like a broad <laughs> overview. Okay. I can. I can. Because that's my question. Like, why ought we follow the categorical categorical imperative? Because that sounds like a moral statement in and of itself. Why ought we? <laughs> well, so the categorical imperative is um, there. There's a few different versions of it, but I think the most well known one is that uh, everything you should uh, you should only do something uh, if you could will it to be a universal law and if it's hypothetically possible uh for it to be a universal law it's yeah, the how, law of universality yeah and how ought we figure out what a universal law ought be and so <laughs> <laughs> why do you have to say ought so many because we're talking about because we're talking about a moral ought here like when we're talking about like a universal imperative of morality this is definitely an ought statement right this is not an is right. statement we're in an ought statement so how do we figure this out so the I, reason basically, like, I, I'm going to keep asking you this until you until you give me some objective fact, and then it's okay. Well, why ought this be this? This is what I'm drilling down to, right? Is um, okay. So the reason why that Kant doesn't run to that issue is because um, he believes that moral claims are synthetic a priori claims, and so that they are still before uh, experience in the mind, and that they only come from pure reason. They don't require looking at the way that the world is. It has nothing to do with the way that humans are born, what they're like. Wait, so how do you it get it? How do you solely from the reason? How do you get a statement like murder is wrong from that then? Because it's 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 true a priori. It's not true. Okay, a that, <laughs> so he just assumes all of his morals are, are unjustified then? Wait, so then why no, can't I all just... morals are totally justified, but they're justified a priori does, synthetic. I thought like does, totally isn't a priori by itself. definition like unjustified, like assumed sure. to be true? Isn't that what a priori means or am I wrong? What do you mean unjustified? Like a priori is something that you assume to be true, no? Or am I, or am I misunderstanding that? Well, no, you don't, you don't assume it to be true. It is true. <laughs> it, if something is true a priori, before experience, before okay, experience I'm sorry, world. it's un... It, it, the, a priori it, it is, doesn't mean true. Okay, can you explain the difference between those statements? Because I don't understand. Okay, so there's a priori, and there's a posteriori, and then there's analytic, and there's synthetic. Those are the four... Um, okay, can you give me an example of an a priori statement? So he would just say, like, murder is wrong and that's all a priori? All bachelors are unmarried. Wait, wait, okay, wait. For, for a moral statement, he would say, like, murder is wrong, and that's just his a priori statement? It's an a priori synthetic statement, yes. Yeah, he thinks it's a transcendental statement. Okay, cool. Well, can I just... Can I make all of my morals like that? <laughs> well, just... you have to justify it from the very core foundations that he does. Well, and... what is his core? I thought you just said it was unjustified. It's just true because it is. I'm well, so confused. On... I'm sorry. It's... Okay, maybe I didn't explain myself well enough. But it's fucking con, so you'll have to forgive me. Um, and I'm not a con to by the way. Uh, I wonder if people are yelling me, yelling at me because I... Uh... Oh, yeah, people are yelling at me. <laughs> um... Mm. So Kant, he essentially seeks out uh, that the way uh, he seeks out the way the cognition works, and he believes that there are two categories of judgment. Uh, there's analytic judgments and there's synthetic judgments, and a priori and a, a posteriori. Uh, well, really, okay. So a priori and a posteriori are epistemological distinctions. So. For example, if I say um, two plus two equals four, actually I shouldn't even say that. Okay, let's say two plus two equals four. I would say that is an a priori judgment because I can do that regardless of experience. And experience doesn't mean like prolonged time, like a time interval. It actually means um, without empirical interaction with the world. Right? So if you cut off all your senses, you can still do math. 
or if you had no senses at all, you could still do math. And there's a hard question there about the legitimacy of something like that. But I mean, let's just assume that's true for a second. Uh, a posteriori means after judgment, or sorry, after experience. So something like that would be um, all bachelors are happy. The only reason why, and I should say that the distinction between a priori and analytic uh, and synthetic and a, a posteriori is very confusing. And I don't want to get into it because we'll be here all night. Let's just sort of call them the same thing, a priori and analytic and a posterior and synthetic. Let's just sort of call them the same thing. Okay. Analytic are statements that are true just completely by definition. So something like all bachelors are married men. It follows from the very definition of uh, bachelor that they are married men, right? Okay. But a claim like all bachelors are happy is not something that follows merely from the definition of bachelor. We actually have to go out into the world and ask, hey, are you happy? Okay, yes. Boom. Tick. 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 Okay? And that's the distinction. And Kant believes... Um, that there are synthetic statements, statements that do require evidence for them, uh, that exist within the mind independently of experience that can be discovered. For example, he believes that math requires a priori evidence, not a posteriori evidence, uh, to justify mathematical claims. Um, and so I'm probably butchering um, Kant right now, and I'm so sorry, other philosophy majors, but I haven't studied Kant for a long time. Um, basically, mathematics has always been considered a priori analytic uh, because people believe that two plus two just follows from the definition of four. And Kant called this into question, saying, well, no, it's not contained within the definition of two plus two. You actually need some evidence that supports that. And blah, 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 blah. He thinks the same thing can be said of moral statements. He believes that you don't need to look at the world to get justification for it, but you do need some sort of evidence that is found within the pure reason to justify these moral statements. And these are, this is evidence that you can discover upon reflection, but they are not just found by definition. You still have to look at the transcendental like method or whatever in order to determine exactly what is moral and what is not moral. You have to use the law of universalization applied to situations, and that is how you discover what is moral and what is not moral. His actual justification for the categorical imperative is over like 2,000 pages long. And I'm sorry if you're expecting me to explain to you that whole line of argument. I can't because there are still philosophers now who don't really truly understand what Kant is going at. People say that Kant is the oldest philosopher right now, or sorry, um, like he's the oldest in terms of writing philosopher that is still regularly being discussed. And people say that everything before Kant is complete dogmatism. Everything that came before Kant is useless now. You don't need it. And I don't believe that, but I mean, that's what a lot of people say. Uh, and so that's where he gets it from. He believes that we don't have to look at experience in order to justify our moral claims. They're all completely derived from pure reason. And I think that's the best, uh, best explanation I can give. Gotcha. Oh, that's the, the best I can do. Um, but look, utilitarianism <laughs> runs into a similar issue with the Izzat gap. Uh, like, how do we, you know, why should we be making people happy? Is Isn't it going from happy to uh, we should make people happy, isn't that a violation of the Yazad gap? Yeah, it, it pretty much is. You can appeal to a teleological system saying that, you know, you can use Cornell realism saying that moral goodness is actually found empirically within the world. That is a, a pretty popular position that people have. It's called Cornell realism. But ultimately, I don't care about any of this. Ultimately, I, I don't. I don't study normative ethics anymore. I used to. I don't anymore. I study meta ethics and I study philosophy of science and math and logic. Um, and ultimately, all I'm arguing for here is the case that uh, morality has to be objective and that it has to have a truth value. And I mean objective in the sense that not that everyone has the same notion of what is true in every single situation. 
but that they have an agreed upon definition of what it takes for something to be um, right or wrong. And so people will say, oh, well, isn't egoism a subjective interpretation of morality? And yes, to an extent they are right because, you know, uh, you'll never really have the same uh, duty. Well, no, see, you do. This is the issue, right? Because all egoists will agree that they have to do what is best for themselves. And in that sense, it is objective, right? But it's still subjective because it doesn't take into account other people's beliefs. Does that make sense? Okay. It is in a universal sort of claim. It's very much a semantical issue that isn't really relevant. But I think perhaps when people hear me say objective, they make they think that I'm talking about a, like a normative system like um, utilitarianism or any form of consequentialism, virtue ethics, uh, deontology, etc. Uh, when in fact, I mean, I think you could argue for a form of subjectivism like egoism or cultural relativism. But I think cultural relativism, egoism can be completely dismissed because they have so many issues with them. Well, uh, systems like um, deontology, utilitarianism don't have nearly as many issues. And I think we should be choosing the normative system that doesn't have as many issues with it. Okay. That's ultimately my view on normative ethics. Gotcha. Um, All right. Fuck, I told my buddy that I would do something. <laughs> Are we... Um... <laughs> Is there any, are there any final closing thoughts you want to give us or anything on this? And then we could chat again. Um, yeah, I mean, ultimately, I think that a lot of people uh, think that, like a lot of people I've seen in chat, and mm-hmm. I mean, I know that, oh, ignore chat or whatever, but I mean, I think it's important that people address chat because a lot of the times they represent the actual majority opinion. And I think the majority of people think that philosophy is some useless discipline that most people shouldn't be going into. And actually, to a large extent, I believe, yes, people really shouldn't be studying philosophy. I can tell you this. If you go into philosophy, uh, you're not doing it for the money, uh, for one. You're doing it because you want to get a better picture of the way that the world is. And philosophers aren't against science. They fully support science. But they also recognize that there is something foundational at the heart of science that scientists don't investigate. And there's something at the heart of mathematics that mathematicians don't investigate. And that's what the philosopher investigates. They, they, they investigate these presuppositions that these other disciplines make. And I think it's imperative that we do so. Because when people make a claim like, oh, morality is an objective, well, that isn't a claim that can be justified by mathematics or science. It has to be justified uh, through something like philosophy. And I think it's very important that some people do recognize this. Uh, and yeah, that's really it. Oh, also, am I able to like give like, uh, can I shill myself out? Yeah, knock yourself out, dude. Okay. Uh, I have a Discord server. It's my little philosophy Discord server, if people are interested. Can I send you a link? Yeah, go for it. You can ch- send it in chat too. Okay, sure. It's called the Salon. There's a, our mods will let you in if you're not absolutely awful. Uh, there's that. Oh, I can't spam it. <laughs> That's right. Uh, it's discord.me slash the Salon. T-H-E-S-A-L-O-N. And I also have a Twitch channel and it's twitch.tv slash Kuhn Fireappen which is K-U-H-N-F-E-Y-E-R-A-B-E-N-D. But you could just find that on the Discord. Um, I I have a feeling I won't be competition for you, Destiny. So, (laughs) Um, yeah, it was a good chat. I enjoy having these discussions. Yeah, thanks. I'm tired now. Okay, well, listen, dude. Have a wonderful sleep. Yeah, you too. Thanks a lot, buddy. Rip on.